We might be live. Let us know if we're live. I am Brandon Sanderson, and I will be your unusually fashionable author for the evening. Um, so there's a story behind this shirt. Uh, my son, Dallin, who's going to be on the stream later today, um, he periodically goes through these periods where he just wants to buy everybody presents. He doesn't really have a good concept of money, even though he's 11. Um, and so he's just like, I want to use my allowance and buy things for everybody. And we usually channel it towards some event. So he decided, with my wife, um, a month ago, he was going to order a t-shirt for everyone for Christmas. And he was going to pick them out because he knew what people liked. Um, and he um, does know what people like, and he also has um, Dallin-style fashion sense. And so we all got very, very bright shirts. He knew I liked over shirts rather than t-shirts, and so he got me one of those. Very, very bright, very, very wonderful um, shirts uh, chosen by my son. And he chose me specifically a frog shirt. Uh, this is because, I don't know if you all have had the sim same experience with young children that I have, but as they grow up, it becomes a matter of important personal identity to have a favorite animal. This is a thing they get asked that they can answer, and it is a thing that, at least my children, use to distinguish themselves from each other. How do I know that I am not the same person as my brother? Well, my pro brother loves orcas, and I love turtles. That is a nice way to differentiate yourself. Um, and so, Dallin's favorite animal is the turtle. And it's a matter of some crisis to young children, I've noticed, if you don't have a favorite animal. And um, to some of them, if you say an animal that doesn't exist, such as a dragon, that's also a matter of some consternation. And so I learned early on when they asked me what my favorite animal was to say, a frog. Um, in part because I do think frogs are cool, but mostly because when my dad, when I was young, my dad would always use the word frog as um, some sort of joke, right? Like, uh, we didn't get our presents from Santa, we got them from Fred the Frog or something like that. It was just a, a word he could substitute for something that would make my brother and I giggle when we were young. And so the frog became my favorite animal uh, once I had children capable of determining that I needed one, otherwise I would face an existential identity crisis. Uh, it made them much more comfortable when I did indeed have a favorite animal. And so Dallin, Knowing that my favorite animal is a frog, uh, look specifically for frog shirts, and the ones that were the most frog of any shirt he could find. And then he gave it to me on Christmas and said, you're going to wear it on stream, aren't you? And I said, absolutely, I'm going to wear it on stream. Um, I told him I would wear it on the week that he came, specifically so that people could compliment him on the frog shirt that he picked for me. Um, the shirts were all very good, uh, very well targeted at the individual, though um, his uncle Jeff, I think, got a pirate kitty shirt, um, which is the only one that we're just not quite sure on. Um, because we're, we're like, when he was picking them, Emily said, are, are you sure? Because Jeff is kind of a subdued, quiet individual uh, who I don't think has a favorite animal, or if he does, he hasn't expressed it to my children. But Dallin's like, no, that shirt is perfect for Jeff. And we still don't quite know why a pirate cat shirt um, would be the, uh, the shirt that uh, was perfect for Jeff, but, um, uh, but he loves it, I am sure. So, uh, how, could you not? how could you not? It's a pirate cat shirt, I mean, yeah. So, um, today he's gonna join us later. Because if you recall, or for those who weren't there when we did the last art slash meme review, that was Dallin's idea, but he was sick when the week that we were ready to do it was. And so Oliver came on in his place um, to, you know, to fill in for his brother. But Dallin was very concerned that everyone know it was his idea and that he would be here next time to do meme review. And so he has been asking ever since when we were going to do another one. And so we are going to go ahead and do that today. 
Uh, I am signing tip and pages for the Way of Kings Leatherbound. They're not tip and pages, actually, these are full signatures. Um, if you haven't been here before, these are for the 2021 Leatherbound Way of Kings from the Kickstarter. All the people who got theirs in the 2020 section should have already received their books. Uh, and if you haven't, I'm sure that my team is working with you to find out what happened. Uh, the rest of you can't get your books until I finish signing all of these because the uh, bindery will not start the order until all 15,000 of them are sent in, um, of which we have around 3,000 left. So I will either finish them tonight or next week, um, where we will stream next week, we decided. And then we're going to go back to our regular schedule of every other week, uh, though it will continue to be on Wednesdays until my class is done. So... Um, until Dallin arrives to do some art with you guys, we're just going to be taking questions and doing our normal thing where I blab at you about various things that interest me while I am signing stacks and stacks and stacks of pages with my name or my initials, my signature. So uh, this first question, and uh, I'm going to do a quick sound check on myself since I didn't do it earlier. It's kind of weird. Uh, it's uh, from Nicholas says, this year I'm trying to write my first novel, but I have a habit of losing interest in whatever I'm working on and get hooked on another idea. Do you have any advice for writers who have trouble sticking to one project instead of starting something new? Yeah, I do. Um, this is actually very, uh, very common. It does happen to people we call um, outline writers more often. Uh, I've noticed than those we tend to focus on as being discovery writers, but uh, it is something that I particularly, um, I could fall into myself because the next project always seems shinier. Um, and this is very much a grass is always greener sort of thing. Um, if it's happened to you habitually and you haven't um, finished very many books, what this most likely is, this is Brandon playing uh, writing, um, writing doctors, so to speak, uh, identif trying to identify what uh, particular writing ailment you have. It's likely that um, it has to do with that in your head, the book, you can see the book. You feel like the book is, is going to work. Um, you f are really excited by it. But when you write it on the page, all of its flaws become manifest. This is one of the things. It might not be your specific one, um, but this is one thing that happens to a lot of people in this situation. I often talk about it like playing jazz music, which uh, I thought would be easier for me when I first uh, practiced it as a teenager in jazz band because I was pretty good at hearing in my head these sort of uh, jazz riffs, these melodies, these improvs. Um, and these sorts of things. But then I did not have the skill to make them come out the front of the horn. I played trumpet. Um, and that was really frustrating to me because I felt like it was perfect up here, but when I played it, it was awful. And you might be having this experience. Um, and the truth is, even up here, it is flawed. You just are covering over those flaws, um, or you're just... You know, you're imagining the parts that work and not the difficult bits between that stick it together. Um, and this is indeed a hurdle you're going to have to get over. And you get over it by practicing. Um, I don't know if just saying this will be helpful, but the truth is until you learn to do that hard thing, which is face the fact that your story, um, that you don't yet have the skill to write your story and you're going to have to do it poorly, until that skill gets better, until you face that and are willing to write and have it turn out, you know, uh, you will just never be able to get better. That is how we get better. Um, the other thing that might ha be happening here, um, and it's a related issue but not exactly the same, is um, daydreaming stories is fun and kind of easy. Um, we enjoy it a lot. It's part of the process that I enjoy the most. Writing is actually hard. It's where the work manifests. And it might not be that, I'm not saying that you're lazy, certainly not. Um, but what it is is sometimes people start writing and they feel like if I were meant to do this, if this were, if I were good at this, or if this were the right story for me to be writing, it would be easy. 
rather than hard. Um, I am here to tell you that that, uh, that can happen when you are very experienced. Um, it never happened to me when I started. Uh, the book, the, the writing was always hard, particularly after about the first three chapters because there's a honeymoon period in starting a story where you're like exploring the ideas and you're writing in the world for the first time um, and all of these things and then it gets hard. It turns into work um, and it, your brain might be lying to you by saying, well, this must not be a, the right story. I'm, maybe I need to move on. Um, now, it's entirely possible that you know all these things already. And what you're really asking um, is, Brandon, I know this. I know that writing gets hard, and I know my instinct is to jump to something that's easier um, and shinier and new. What do I do to make myself do it anyway? And in that case, it comes down to personal motivation. This is a thing I talk about a lot. Everyone is motivated in different ways, and understanding how you are motivated is going to help you overcome these things. One of the best things you can do in life is figure out how to make yourself do the things you want to have done, right? Um, I'm sorry if uh, that sounds uh, repetitive to things I've said before. Uh, but um, I have found that for the majority of people, goals and consistency and good habits are the way to achieve what you want to achieve. Um, not letting yourself jump to a new project and instead saying, all right, um, so there, there are a few interim tricks you can try. You can say, all right, I'm a little bored with this right now. Um, what can I do to make this scene that I have to write next more exciting? Uh, if I ever get in a situation where I'm just working on a scene and I'm not feeling it, I will try it from a different viewpoint. I will try the scene in a different location. I will try injecting a new or interesting short-term conflict into the scene. Um, I will... Um, like I said, in a different location, but I'll do something really interesting with the setting. I'll be like, all right, can we have this conversation by a waterfall instead? So I have just a different feel, um, a different sound, a different uh, setting to play with. All of these things can shake up uh, when you're feeling just a little bit stuck on a scene. Um, but the honest truth is, write it anyway. Write it knowing it's not going to be perfect. Uh, write it knowing that you would rather be writing something else right now be because something else is easier. Um, and write it knowing that this is where writing stops being just a hobby and starts being um, self-improvement, if that makes sense. Uh, and set goals. Keep track of your, what you're doing daily. And don't let yourself work on that new project. Um, make yourself... There is a danger of stuffing too many ideas in the book, but make yourself take that cool thing that you're excited by and find a way to work it into your current story. Um, it is just a really important thing to learn that will separate the amateur who never finishes the book from the journeyman writer who is capable of consistently telling stories um, and achieving their goals. Um, hope that that is useful and not just a, another time of me saying, well, go practice some more, um, even though that's kind of what it was. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly who asked this question, but they mm -hmm. were wondering if you ever uh, suffered from imposter syndrome, and maybe you wanted to talk about imposter syndrome a little bit in writing. Sure, I can. Uh, so here's the thing. That other one that I just answered, I dealt with that a lot. I have not really dealt with imposter syndrome. Um, whatever my brain psychology is, this is not a thing that has ever really struck me. Um, and I think the way that I got into writing uh, helps with that, right? Um, I felt like a professional before I sold anything. And I treated this like a job before I was earning money at it. And I was used to taking feedback. And I had had some very important moments where I decided this is what I wanted to do. And I was pleased with my writing. Even if it eventually turned out to not be um, pu publishable, you know, m make a living of um, I was okay with that because the writing itself was the pleasure and the self-improvement part of it was a big part of why I was doing it. Um, imposter syndrome, like, it's hard for me to talk on not feeling it, so you should really talk to people who do. But I worry that it comes from um, this sense that... 
Like, if you are more worried about what people think of your stories um, than, uh, than perhaps is right, then I think imposter syndrome could be more likely. If you are writing books because you know you would be writing books until the day you die, um, this is what you do. This is, your, this is one of your passions. And uh, a bad review doesn't change the fact that it's your passion, that you have improved yourself by writing it, that you enjoy it, um, and that other people seem to enjoy it as well. And kind of centering your confidence on that rather than the actual text, um, I think, helps a lot. Uh, but as I said, I don't feel this. And I think imposter syndrome tends to be one of those things that is irrational. And um, because of that, it's like not your fault, right? Um, we all have aspects of uh, things that we do are, that are irrational. And some of these, like imposter syndrome, like um, some very famous, very um, skilled, and very well-established authors I know still feel imposter syndrome. And... That's not their fault. There's nothing that's not like they have a wrong way um, of acting or thinking or that their confidence is somehow inferior. They just have that psychological quirk. Um, and so you may want to ask them how to combat it. Um, but I would guess maybe the one reason I don't deal with it as much is that whole spending 10 years writing 13 books and knowing I would just be writing books anyway. Um, I'm not an imposter because I can demonstrably prove to myself and to anyone who'd ask that this is indeed my passion. And um, you don't have to like the stories. That's totally OK. Art is uh, very subjective. But I like the stories. And because I like the stories, and because I enjoy writing them, and because doing so, I think, fulfills me and makes my life better, um, I'm going to keep doing it uh, regardless of what the, um, the opinion of it might be. It's not an excuse to not get better, um, but it is an excuse to not feel imposter syndrome. Uh, Joe Collins has a question that I'm going to alter just a little bit. All right. Um, what was your inspiration for The Knights Radiant? Um, it's hard to point to one inspiration um, because... Doing a story about knights, right? Like the restoration of a knightly order, like goes all the way back in my brain. Uh, and there are so many different angles that inspired it. One inspiration is that a lot of the book series I was reading um, in my teens and 20s when I was developing Stormlight were about magic leaving the world, um, which is a cool story. It is the story of Lord of the Rings. It is the story, to an extent, of, um, of um, Wheel of Time. Or at least that's what it felt like at certain points in the story. Um, I don't think it ended up that way. But that was, there was certainly this sense of the, the world um, is getting less magical, and it's slowly turning into our world. Terry Brooks has a series that basically is you know, Shannara turning into our world. Um, all of these things about magic going away, and I um, prefer stories about magic awakening um, and um, uh, magic being discovered and investigated. And so the idea of these orders of, uh, of knights whose powers were lost um, and who people are now recovering them was really cool to me. Um, you certainly would have to point at the Jedi as a theme for that, right? Like, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. There's no way that Star Wars wasn't a huge influence on everything that I do. That was the specific part of oh, the was question. Yeah. So they were wondering if the Jedi were an influence, but I wanted right. to make it a little um, bit more broad. So. Yeah, I, didn't, I wouldn't say that I thought it was the single influence, but, man, you cannot separate someone <clears throat> from, of my generation so steeped in pop culture as I was. Um, from um, Star Wars as a deep cultural influence. Um, another inspiration I often bring up is I wanted to do magical power armor. I wanted knights who were essentially the tanks of a medieval battlefield, um, even more so than they were in our world. Like They, they were just these, um, these forces that infantry could virtually never face on their own without special equipment and a lot of luck. Uh, and that was really cool to me. Um, being able to have giant magic swords and explain them in a way that you 
actually make sense? Like, why would people need these large, cool, ornate fantasy swords that you sometimes see in fantasy art that are wildly impractical? Why would they exist if they did? Um, why would they maybe have needed them? And what would make them actually work? Those sorts of things uh, were also big influences. Um, so we have my son, Dallin, here. Uh, Dallin is going to come join me. Um, they have a chair right there for you, Dallin, the stool. And I'm going to scoot over a little. You might be too tall. Yeah, it's probably OK, right? Um, about the same height as me. So you guys have seen Dallin. Oh, you're wearing um, your turtle shirt. I'm wearing a turtle shirt. I explained to them. Um, why I got this shirt, because frogs are my favorite animal, and that you uh, bought for Christmas everyone's shirts. What was the shirt that you got for Jeff again? It was like Cat Kraken. Cat Kraken. Kraken Cat. That's right. Kraken cat. Yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Um, everybody got cool t-shirts. That is a microphone. I know. I said, what if I do if I talk right into it? Uh, it would be really loud for the people listening, because it's adjusted so that it, um, it is for you. Uh, at that distance. So, um, and if you're too quiet, he'll um, Adam will adjust it on his end, so okay. you can just talk whatever noise level you want to. Okay. I talk in my normal noise level. Yep. So, so, Dallin was the one who was most excited that I was a YouTuber now, because Dallin likes YouTube, and Dallin is an artist, and Dallin loves memes, and so Dallin suggested that we start doing some meme, meme reviews. reviews. But I was sick at the time, so Oliver came over and did it. Yeah. Me. Substitute. But Substitute. I told them that it was your idea and that it was like your thing to do the meme, meme reviews. So. Uh, okay. So, Dallin, you're, uh, you're what grade? Fifth grade? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in fifth grade. Fifth grade. Yeah. And how's school going this year? Wearing a lot, masks a lot? Uh, it's going like uh -oh. this. It's going like this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is going like that. Uh, I'm wearing the mask upside down. Yeah. <laughs> there. On a mask. Ow. So we're going to pull up some art. <laughs> and you're going to, we're going to talk about it. This is art I haven't seen. Um, and Adam collected. Some of them will be memes, some of them will just be fan art. Okay. And I like we're just going to have you well, talk about. Well, I said about fan art reviews. I yeah. didn't say meme reviews oh, technically. Yeah. I said fan art reviews. Oh, okay. Because fan art. Hey, you have a. Wait, Dad. Hey, yes. This mask so far. That is a Stormlight Archive mask, yes. Okay. Um, that's the one that, that I wear. You guys haven't seen them. It's a uh, bridge four. Yeah, it, but COVID. You 19. have not Stay safe. read any of my books, right? Um, uh, was it? Um, it was the one that you. I've heard half of it of um, Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarians yes. because you read it to us when, to me and Joel when we were really yes. little. You so were really young. I don't really remember anything except for mm -hmm. the Evil Librarians. But you know kind <laughs> of about remember. them. So let's pull yes, up the piece, kind of first of piece of fan art and we'll see what you think about it. It's going to be on this screen right in front of us here. So what do you think of that art? That is, that is cool. That is cool? Yeah. Do you know who Kaladin is? We talked about that. Is Kaladin, yeah, that's Kaladin? Yeah, that's Kaladin. Whoa. It has like things, like things going, whatever those things are going around him. Yep, those are called spren. Spren? Yep. And then he's like a spear and it's just. Yep, it's forming. Forming. Forming out of nothing, yeah. Out of nothing. That's one of, that's one of his Thin powers air. in the books. Is that's he's cool. He's got this spear. Wait, is it, his eyes are glowing. Yeah, his yeah. Eye, eyes are glowing. Mm -hmm. His mouth is glowing. Yeah. Are his nostrils growing? Blowing. I don't usually His nostrils think, are glowing. Are his nostrils glowing? I guess they are. Um, that's because um, uh, Stormlight, which is the way they power their, uh, their magic, kind of leaks out of them. Um, people can't hold it in uh, very well, and so it kind of will leak out, and so a lot of the art has It looks that. really cool. It looks really cool. Yeah, I, I want to draw stuff like that. <laughs> I'm terrible compared to these people. Well, you are 11 years old. These people are much older. So Yes, they are... Eventually, like you want to do like graphic like novels, even right? Old, even like graphic novels? Or did you? No, you wanted, wanted to do, do YouTube cartoons. I wanted to do cartoons. Cartoons. No, not I didn't want to do YouTube. I wanted oh. to do cartoon. You stuff. just want to do animation? Animation stuff and game, video games, or whatever it can evolve. That yes. kind of stuff. All right. So I'm. Um, uh, let's let's pull up one of the memes. So do um, they see it right over here? They see it. Um, right I think it here? replaces us, right, Adam? 
Yes. It replaces oh, us, but it's it not a picture us. in picture. Yep. So if, it, if now they can see us back again? Mm, yeah, they can now they can see you again. Oh, okay, so. I am so confused. What is that? Wait, what? That, that looks like a meme. Uh, we saw it, but then it vanished, Adam. Oh. Uh, we saw it just briefly, and it moved off to the side. Oh, there we uh, go. It's a monkey? Uh, yeah, so people have started making um, uh, hot chocolate bombs. Um, and uh, that they make them like these chocolate things you put in your your thing your pan. No, that's not a monkey because it's a. Why am I saying it's a monkey? That's, that's not, not a monkey. I'm. It's not that's dumb. That's a. That's an ape, right? I know it's a gorilla. Yep. It's a gorilla. Or, no, that's definitely not a orangutan. That's a gorilla. So uh, he says, "Listen, kid. Uh, by the way, Dallin is dyslexic. Huh, oh, Dallin? Yes. Uh, so Dallin is." A much better reader than he used to be, but yes. reading's still not uh, something... I, can't, I don't know why it doesn't... Un I don't understand how I can't read. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. You're working on it. You work with the yeah. dyslexia, dyslexia Clinic. Um, and he knows that, like, Dave Pilkey, who's one of his favorite yes. authors, is Yes, Dave Peakley is, is Peakley? amazing. Is that how you say it? Okay. Yeah, Dave Peakley. Uh, the dog man author. Yes. So this is and the... It says, listen, kid, I don't have much time. The way Brandon Sanderson writes so many books so fast is... And then he melts. Um, so I guess I'm not familiar with this meme format. Um, I uh, guess the joke is that uh, they're going to tell you something really important, but they end up melting first. What do you think? Is that what the meme is about, or am I missing this? You're more of a meme expert than I am. I have. Um, he's like he's about to tell you something, and then he's just like he's like he's saying he's like um, this. Um, he's saying, listen, kid, they we don't have much time. You write books so fast, and then like all of this coming up is so many books that just comes up. Yeah, it's just like all the books is just coming up. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the inverse of the scroll of truth. Yes, uh huh. It's just like so many that it's just like yeah. The monkey's just like I'm getting no. All right, let's do another fan art. Oh, it is hard to go back and. Forth. Oh, is it? So, all right, so let's just do memes for a while, and then we'll do okay. fan art. I just assumed because you had more fan art, we'd do a couple fan art and then one meme, but. Yeah, just go back and forth. Or don't go back and forth. Okay. Just uh, just give us memes for so a little bit. So people watching this get those? So people watching these might oh, have bought them. Oh, it's Lord of the Rings. Yes, it is. You like Lord of the Rings, huh? Yes. Uh, the Way of Kings. So uh, I, I guess the Way of Kings is build a pony. Um, and I am um, Pippin. Or I don't even know the... <laughs> The in between Pippin yeah. or yes or Mary. Mary and Pippin. I, I think I got that right, right? Pippin's the one that sings to, uh, um, and so he's the one that's speaking. Uh, so um, they say, "What about prologue?" And the reader's like, "You've already had it." And they say, "We've had one, yes, but what about second prologue?" <laughs> so in the Way of Kings, which is the big, 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 thick book that Calvin's in, um, it. Uh, I, it has two prologues. I just named one of them the prelude. Uh, and so it's a little bit confusing because you read the prologue and then you think that you're, you're done with the prologue. And the prologue takes place like thousands of years ago, right? Before the book starts. But then we jump to another prologue that takes place five years before the book actually starts. I get starts. that. That's actually hilarious because he goes, like, he's like, he's like, um, what about brec um, breakfast? Yeah. <laughs> and then, no. he's, and then like, he's like, you already had breakfast. What about second breakfast? Yeah. He's like, what about lunch and dinner and second yep. dinner? Eleven Z's. And, and eleven Z's. Yeah. Yes. Eleven Z's. Eleven Z's. Yes. <laughs> and so my book, uh, they're joking about second prologue, which it <laughs> honestly, the, the, the funniest thing is it actually has a third prologue because chapter one is another prologue. I just called it chapter one because chapter one's about a different character and takes place several years before the main story still. It's not until you get to chapter two that you actually get to the main story of the book. Uh, and so, uh, so it's, it's a little goofy. Can you believe that I'm a little goofy in my books? Okay. Then it's no, also super everybody, serious. Everybody type down below that my dad's goofy. Okay. So a couple fan arts. The comments for you. were everywhere. Okay, fan arts. All right. Is it there right now? It is. What do you I think bet nobody's one? actually going to do that. Let's say my dad's goofy. Everybody oh, knows. I bet that they will. Uh, Are you sure? Yes. I bet oh, that they will. Oh, it's Syl. Yes, it is Syl. Um, and... Arrows um, onto a shield and a spear. And yep. Syl. Yep. So that's Kaladin again. So yeah, in, I know Kaladin. In the book, in the Way of Kings, Kaladin 
his uh, his job. Um, uh, they they make a, he's a slave and they force him into the army and he has to like I, carry he's, he's these like bridges. He's, he's like a grunt. He's a grunt. grunt. Yes, he's, he's grunt. like a grunt. He's like a grunt from Halo. He's like a grunt from Halo without the mask and the silly voice. Um, and, and without the headshot, they go yippee. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think he would say yippee if he got headshotted. <laughs> uh, we are all playing Halo Four together right now, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, we always turn on grunt birthday parties, so we get showers of confetti and things like that. Yes, that's the only, that's like one of the. Only but you had a complaint um, about Halo Four. The grunts look weird. You don't like the design on them, huh? The grunts. I don't like the design on the grunts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I had never played Halo Four before until the Master Chief Collection because I didn't have the right Xbox for that one. I had only played Halo One, Two, and then I played three Wait, at someone else's house. I thought this house. was about your book, and now it's going to Halo. Yeah, we talk about whatever we feel is interesting. Okay, um, then th that means we can talk about a table. We could talk about a table if we actually that found it interesting. That table's tan, and that table's white. Yes. Do you find that interesting? No. Here, put this on the table <laughs> next to right there. Uh, I'm not going to lie, that was incredible delivery. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dallin is pretty funny. Uh, you, you, Dallin's probably the funniest of my children. Um, uh, Peter P. Yeah. says, I love Lamp, if you watched Anchorman. Okay, I haven't actually oh. ever seen Anchorman. So somebody um, in the comments said that? Yeah, it's from a movie I haven't seen. Those, that one's going to be really heavy now. That's going to be. Yeah. So. Um, you have to sign a ton. How do you, is it, is it annoying to sign this much? Uh, it, if I had to sign them without talking to people or doing something fun, it would be really annoying. Is this fun? better than books? Um, but it is way better than when, uh, like two years ago, when, or even last year, yeah. right? Um, where uh, Kara would just set up down here in the basement just thousands of books, and I would have to like lift them. And I um, I don't write short books, so the books uh, you end up with a sore arm from lifting books. You just like uh, right. Yeah. Eh, right, um, and opening all the pages, so this is a lot easier. Can you do a time lapse of that? Skyline, mm -hmm. though. What's that? I do miss the Mayan skyline. Yes, the why skyline. We, why are we yeah. still looking at this one? Oh, well, we might talk about it still. It's, did, did he you, has his, he has like the, is that his skirt? Uh, skirt? Yeah, he, he's his wearing skirt. like a leather armor that they, leather armor and that were like skirts back then. And um, he, he is, he, he, it looks like he's crying. <laughs> yeah, that's because of the, um, either stormlight coming out of him. Remember how I said it leaks? Yeah, power. Um, yeah. And things so okay. that the, the in the stories, he has to carry with like a bunch of other people a big bridge they're going to put across the gap. They're the grunts. They don't even get weapons. Um, what? Yeah, they don't let them have weapons. They have to just carry this bridge so the other soldiers can go across, and the enemy shoots arrows at them. And so um, Kaladin often um, would be in the situation where people are shooting arrows, and he eventually managed to get um, a shield and a weapon and block some of the arrows, and that's probably right after um, that scene. The arrows are still shooting at him. The arrows are kind of still shooting. That's true. Yeah. What? Syl so. doesn't, Syl doesn't look like she's... Yeah, she, she cares. <laughs> she doesn't yeah. look like she's just like, yeah, there's arrows. Well, I mean, she they can't do anything to her. Yeah, right? well, yeah she's, but she's a ghost, right? She's a, a spren, which is kind of like a cross between a spirit and a fairy. Spirit and a fairy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Spirit. Sperry. I got it. Sperry. <laughs> she's a sperry. Thank you very much. <laughs> For adding that incredibly dignified uh, word, I should have named them Sperry's instead of Spren, huh? Yes. Uh -huh. It, although it does sound like something she would name herself. Yes, that is true. Uh, Syl, um, a lot of times things that people say in real life end up in the books. Uh, Syl, at various points in the book, says, I'm intelligent and articulate, which is actually I took from your mom. When your mom was a, was a toddler, one of her aunts taught her to say that as one of her first words. Um, she, she would, they would, she would say, I am intelligent and articulate. And it's like the only thing that she could say. Um, <laughs> and so I, I borrowed that and put it in the books, uh, because it gives your mother a smile every time she runs across it. Yes, that's great. All right. Next piece of fan art. Whoa. Ooh. 
So now we have some Mistborn fan art. It's as a is that a red sun or a red moon? The, red is it the sun. blood moon or the red or the blood sun? So no, Scadrial doesn't have a moon, so it is the sun. This is a world where um, giant volcanoes have exploded and keep ash and dust hey, and stuff in the air. So ash the sun, fell from the sky. That's right. It's the first line. Oh, ash fell from the sky. Um, and it's always like um, the sky is always red. Sky is always red. Yep. Sky is always red. Mm -hmm. So they got spiky temple thingies. Yep. I, they, and then they got houses down below, and he's standing on a house. He's sitting on a house top. He's yeah. sitting on a house top, and um, there's a rainbow dome at the side of him. Yeah. What's in the? Can you see what's in the streets? Uh, fog. Yep. Or mist, because it's mist. from Mistborn. Oh, it's from Mistborn. Yep. Yeah, I I get that. Can I? Which is your favorite so far of the three fan arts that we've seen? Oh, uh, I like. The first one. The first Kaladin? Yeah, the okay. first Kaladin looked cool. That yeah. one, yes, that one. Mm. It looked really cool. Which of your of the Halos has been your favorite so far? I like the story of Halo too. You like but the story I just, of Halo too? I just wish that you could run on it. Yeah, not being able to run is really annoying. Yeah, I always tried to run because in other games you can run by pressing shift. Yeah. And it just... And he doesn't. And he just keeps plodding along at the same speed. Yeah. It is. It it's is. like, Master Chief, why can't you run any faster? Mm hmm. But in the cutscenes, he runs even faster than he does in the actual game. I know. That's not and fair. And he gets blown up by a nuke in the cutscenes, and he survives that. Yeah. But he can't survive a single rocket launcher. I'll, you're going to have to. We're just going to have to go to, to Bungie or 343 um, and say, my, my son has found some continuity errors. In, in your games. Can you please address these? No, that would be too OP for the game because then how that would be too OP to run super fast in the game and also And be able to survive a nuke. Yeah, and be able to survive a nuke and not and But you want you you keep saying you wish that they would put on um you know a skull that makes it like a skull for yeah. kids, right? No, not for technically not for kids that makes it you no know, a skull that is why would a kid play that game? I'm well well I'm a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, well, I'm 10. I don't think a, uh, like somebody 5 would play it. You're not 10 anymore. I'm not 10. I'm 11! Yep. Keep forgetting. It was last month. But so, yes, you, but you wish that they had handicaps so that you could make it a little easier. No, no, time no, no I'm saying like what if there was a thing that could just for fun, not for make it easier, just uh -huh. for fun to make it like how it is in the cutscene so you run super fast and you, and you could just punch something and it blows up. You can not start with the scarab gun. Scarab laser, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Scarab laser, shooting great. scarab lasers. Out of any gun? You can just uh, turn on a skull that makes all of your guns shoot a scarab laser. That, that's great. Okay, mm -hmm. should we see the next one? Or yep, not? let's do the next one. All right. So, so many still. Yep. Wait, why is still this big this time? There is a point in the book where still uh, is big. Um, my, and my mind is just broken. Um, My last two brain cells are dying at this moment. <laughs> um, yeah, she. Uh, I I foreshadow through the book that she can change shapes into different things, and then I uh, use uh, appearing as uh, kind of full human size as kind of a hey, this moment is different. Something is going on. Uh, just the, going on. Just a yeah. So um, and it looks like we got another uh, cowlid in there. Yeah, another cowlid in super tall grass and wheat. I can see wheat at the very That's front. That's true. That grass is not scared of them. It should be. Do you know that in Stormlight Archive, the, the grass um, gets scared of people and hides? Yeah. That um, eats a little grain of grass or a uh, stalk of grass. My last two brain cells are dying at this moment. <laughs> you already said that. I know, but they're happening again. Oh, okay. They, they got resurrected. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then they died again. Where did you learn that phrase? I haven't heard you say that before. It's only when everything gets super weird. Okay. <laughs> that was, I learned a long time ago, so, yeah. Okay. When everything doesn't make sense to my friends. Do we want to do a couple more memes, or do you have another fan art? Oh, let's do but one more. I like, how the okay. I like how they keep doing those clouds, like, thundery in yeah. every single Well, there's a, in the Stormlight Archive, it's, there's a storm. There's wait, a magical storm. Wait, there's a red sun at the side. Um, no, you can that know. is the background. Wait. Oh, I suppose there is some. Yeah, red. there is some at the end of the sea. Look at the end of the sea. Yeah, there may be a sunset or yeah, maybe it's, some something. It's the, from the red sky. Well, that's a different book that has the red sky. Oh. That's Mistborn. Oh, it's Mistborn. Yeah. But every... Every uh, book 
You can have a red sky if it has a sunset. Yes, every every single dimension if it has a sunset. No, wait, what if it has a green sun sunset? A green sunset? Even though the, the... Like Mars is blue. Yeah. It's what the atmosphere is made up of. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could have a green sunset. I suppose you could. Uh, just you're... probably not on an atmosphere that was uh, uh, conducive to human beings' existence <sighs> there, but... They... Yeah. I want to see another one. These are interesting. Okay. okay. Adam has another one. He told me he had 10 fan art and um, five memes that we could go through. So it's the guy from the same person, right? Nope, that's not Kaladin. That's the guy from the that that is, on top of the That is, guess what his name is. Who? Dalinar. Oh, it's Dalinar. Yes. Yes, the one that he, he was named after me? Or yeah. Was I named you were named him? after him. Oh. Um, his name, uh, so for many years, uh, Dallin thought that Dallinar's name was Dallin with an R middle initial, just like your middle source initial is M. And you'd be like, I'm Dallin M. Oh, you still think that? His... No, I don't. What okay. do you mean? I, when you're a kid, you're like, hey, what's his middle name? If it's Dallin R, what's the R stand for? But is your Dallin M. But uh, his just is a fantasy version of the name Dallin, kind of. Um, I've had his name in my head for years and years and years, decades. Um, and all of my kids kind of are slightly half named after a character in the book, kind of by accident. Uh, we just happen to like the names. Um, like Joel's named after Joel from the Rhythmatist, but it's because the Rhythmatist hadn't been published and we just really liked the name Joel, which is why I used it in a book. No, wait, so, so was he made before me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, he existed before you. I spelled his name differently oh. in Way of Kings Prime. Um, but we both like the name Dallin. Uh, for those who don't know, there's a... Um, a church apostle in our church named Dallin, um, Dallin H. Oaks. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, it's a name that's uh, a little common through the Intermountain West here. Um, I think the origin is Scandinavian. He just killed somebody. Um, and so. On one side he killed somebody, on one side he didn't. Yep, so Dallin, our story is a, um, is a soldier and a warrior, and in the past he was kind of a brutal one. He was a conqueror, and as he's gotten older, he has uh, become a little more philosophical, um, though not uh, necessarily any less uh, determined. And so it's, they're like showing young Dalinar and old Dalinar, because uh, you can see the, the white in his hair on the, uh, the one on the right side um, and the scars on his why face. Why is he dirty on the other side? Uh, it's probably right after he marched through. Um, there's a scene in the flashbacks where people have set a field on fire to try to stop the, the armies, and he just marches through it anyway. So he goes kind of through the, the soot and the ash of a, of a burning fire um, and then attacks on the flank where they had hoped he wouldn't come with his army. So I Is bet that, that blood scene. his blood or somebody else's blood? Um, it's probably his blood. He gets his nose broken in that scene. Um, but it could very well be someone else's. So he can't smell. Uh, he uh, can smell. Once your nose resets, you can, st you can smell. But it, it is a little crooked because uh, he got it broken in that scene. Oh. Why did you choose a nose? Why did you choose a nose mm -hmm. to get broken? Mm -hmm. um, it happens fairly often in combat. Um, and so it's a common wound that soldiers will get. And it's a very visible one. Like when you describe a character um, and you can say, it looks like his nose was broken at one point. Because the nose, if, unless you set it just right, you can so tell. So his nose could be like broken like that? It's not all the way sideways. It's just usually just a little rift in it. Um, and so it's a nice little writing shorthand where you can be like, this person has been in some fights. Uh, they had a broken nose at one point. Um, and so that's, uh, it's a nice little descriptive thing you can do. Okay. He's big eyebrows. He does have big eyebrows in this art. That's for sure. The more better to scowl at you with. Now you're going to the big red wolf. Yes. Well, little writing. Do you want water? There's another water bottle there you can have. No, thanks. Okay. I'm fine. So we're going to go to memes now? Memes. Meme review. So you guys can see me right now? They can see you. Now they can't. <laughs> oh, it's an inverted cow. Yes. So in the Stormlight Archive, um, they don't use coins for money, and they don't use dollar bills. They use glowing gemstones. Glowing. glowing gemstones. Because the inverted version of brown, I know it's like bluish. Because if you grab, if you grab the, the I'm not, I don't, I'm not scientific. I can, you can just look it up. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not your Google Home. <laughs> no, they're not your Google Home. Uh, but when uh, they are, they don't have any light in them. They're called done. And when they have light in them, they're called fused. 
so infused. And so a, the, someone found a, uh, a shop called the Dun Cow, uh, and they took a picture <laughs> of it and uh, made an infused cow to, to <laughs> infused share with cow. everyone. Yes, yes, that's great. And we have one more meme. Oh, uh, we have three more memes. Three more memes. Three oh, more I, memes. I miscounted. All right, let's do some more memes. You get a lot of memes of you, Dad. <laughs> I do get. Well, these are all from the memes about me or my books. I know. I mean, we're not going to do meme reviews on memes not related to the books, probably. Yeah, I know. So, I... new toothpaste gets released. Dentist. <laughs> so, uh, looks like they've been uh, screen capturing from my uh, stream or uh, something. And there's an old thing commercial that used to say, 9 out of 10, 10 dentists say you should use our, our toothpaste. And so people make a lot of memes about 9 out of 10 liking something. So they've got nine Brandon uh, smiling faces and one Brandon serious face uh, about, the, about the toothpaste. <laughs> Not really working for you? That's, that's hilarious. Let's get another one, Alan, uh, uh, Adam. I kind of want the... Okay. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. Da -da 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 -da. What's the Wi-Fi password? It's on the back of the router. The back of the router lists that as the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> so, um, may, sometimes I'm a little too cute for my own good. Um, and in uh, the second Stormlight book, at the beginning of the books, there's always those little quotes about the world or different things. And I know, in, I get the joke, though. In I one know. of the books... Um, they, there is uh, the writings of a person who's gone a little bit insane and a little bit uh, super smart at the same time. And so all, a lot of the phrases are weird things. And one of them is just a bunch of numbers um, where uh, it's just meant to be a little confusing. Did you just randomly type it? I didn't actually. There, I wrote something and then transferred it into numbers. It's actually, there's a pattern to it and things like that. I got one of them wrong, one, one number wrong though. Uh, which, so, but you know. It was a typo that we made when we were transcribing it, obviously. But then you then then you fixed that? Yeah, and the fans figured out what it meant. I can't remember. I, I'd have to go back to the book where I have it translated. Um, but the funny thing is, do you know how I have audiobooks yeah. of my books? Yeah. So when the audiobook reader got to this chapter, uh, Michael Kramer, he had to read that. He had to read one one eight two five one zero one 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 two seven one two four. It just read the whole thing. And I hadn't even thought about how it would sound really weird when you're listening to the audiobook. Because when you see it on the, the page and you get to that, you're just like, oh, a bunch of numbers. That's funny. And you move on. But the audiobook people, I'm sure, had, were like, all right, fast forward 15, fast forward 30, fast forward two minutes. Okay, finally done with the random string of numbers. Final meme? Final meme. That's the final meme. <gasps> it's, um, the, is it from Star Wars? It's from Star Wars. Yes, it's from Star Wars. It says, waiter, did you enjoy your meal? Lift, who's a character in books who's always wanting more food. The first order was only the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Yeah, That's a line from the movie. The first order's like, um, the, That's like the Empire and the, in the new Star Wars movies. And so. Um, a certain character that, uh, I, I don't think we're, you know, we're spoiling a year old movie, um, or two year old movie was like the first order was only the beginning, but they're saying Lyft would say that at the restaurant because she would want more food. <laughs> All right, let's do like three more pieces of fan art. Then Dallin has to go no, off. Is there any more fan art after that? Well, we can get more, but we don't have, um, like... Yeah. Oh, wow. There's a very nice Dalinar done realistically. That is really realistic. Wow. What is the, 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 the platform they do all this in? I could probably... Like Blender only, or I something? Could probably, or? Yeah, probably. There's one of these, these programs. That's a really nice If uh, I had Dalinar. that program, I could only do the hair. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, all I could you do. You can practice. Steve Argyle, who was on a little while ago, told me that we need to get you um, uh, Procreate. Um, procreate. Said it's really, really good. Yeah, procreate is the thing I said I mm -hmm. wanted. Yeah, Remember? I know. We just have to get you an iPad because we don't have iPads. We have I all want Android the, stuff. The, the, you know the iPad, the cool iPad. Yes, of course you want. No, we have iPad. one. We have one iPad. We have Mom's iPad, I suppose. We could probably just get procreate on that, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's uh, an no. old iPad, huh? Yeah, it's kind of old. 
That's my favorite, I think, so far. Uh, I really like After that. After I'm done, I'm going to see how uh, many people it. typed that my dad is... Is goofy? <laughs> yeah, that he, my dad is goofy. I want to see how much after I'm doing with this. I want to see how much people do that. All right. Get us another fan art. Whoa. Whoa. I actually really like that style. I like that style a lot, too. It's still. Man. That, that's she looks a like really she's, nice graphic she looks like she's style a piece or of fire. something like that. She looks like she's a piece of fire. Yeah, a blue flame. Yeah. Um... And Thumbs up to this person. That's yeah. my new favorite. Yeah, uh, that's that my is, new favorite. Wait, that he... is fantastic. That's cool. That's, that's mm -hmm. just cool. Yeah. Do you think the person who made these are, are here? Um, probably not, would be my guess. But it's possible. If you made um, one, if somebody made one of these, like in this, would they put it? They would. Would they put that they made it? Uh, yeah. The the person who made it is down in the corner. Um, Adams always uh, makes sure to find out who it was so we can. Uh, we can attribute them because it's even though it's my character, it's their art. Uh, so we want to make sure. Yeah, it's really that's really good. I like it. Yeah. So if one of you, the artists, are in this, um, these have all been fantastic. You can say hi. Uh, we won't see you, but Adam my might. favorite my favorite type of art is not completely realistic. Yeah. I like like this. Mm -hmm. It's cool. I'm all right. Cartoony. Let's see. What else we got, Adam? Is this the last one? Yep. Uh, the last one? Ah. This is this the actual last one? I think this is going to be the actual last one. Um, and so that um, looks like Navani um, with her pain real on would be my guess. Pain uh, real? Yep, she is a does inventor. Make, and she does invents. Pain, does it make pain real? So in the Stormlight Archive, we have something called a fabrial. And in fabrial. their language, real means. Uh, does that um, make fabric real? No, it doesn't make fabric real. <laughs> uh, it's a word for a magical artifact that is created, a scientifically created magical artifact, basically. I say real. I didn't say real. I said real. Real. Because um, pain, pain and real. And Navani is um, one of the characters, and she is a scientist. These lights are bright. So uh, that's also a very cool style. It looks like an illuminated manuscript, like an old Bible that people have affixed uh, gold foil leaf or things to. Hmm. Um, is that the actual last thing? What's that? Adam, is there any more fan art? That's it. That's it. That's all of our fan art. We'll have to uh, collect some more for your... So is this actually the end of the, the thing? No, I still have thousands more of these to sign. Um, but most of the time we'll be doing Q&A. But if you guys have a question... I want to do Q&A. For Dallin. No, I want to do Q&A. Okay. We'll take a couple questions for no, Dallin. I, you don't I have wanna, to go yet. I, wanna, I don't want to go at all. I want to be here for the whole thing. <laughs> uh, I know some people were asking you to dab. Okay. There it is. I hope the chat no, is happy. No, they didn't see it. Oh, the fan art oh. was up. No, no. Okay, it's... he pulled it down. Okay. Yeah. So they saw the dab? They saw the dab. I'm going to dab again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Do you dab, you guys these days only dab like ironically, meaning it's a joke when you dab, huh? Yeah. Cool. Uh, what else they got? You guys can ask questions of my 11 year old. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. We already talked about your favorite book. Yes. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. That last time he was here, uh, we talked about his favorite book. If you don't know it, then you can just go. Go all the way. There's just a little bit of a delay. Yeah, the, they'll so, start asking questions in uh, a second here. What is your favorite turtle? Turtle? Mm -hmm. mm, I don't have one. I like all turtles the same. Not Sheldon? Well, yeah, I like Sheldon a lot. Slightly I have, more. I like yeah. him slightly more because I have him. He's my tortoise. He's so cute. He is super cute. <laughs> yeah. And Dallin is a good turtle dad. Yeah. Oh, hey. Um... Dallin, um, uh, so I was talking to Donald yesterday, you know how I went to see yeah. him, and I told him how uh, you were trying to give me ideas for Fortnite. <laughs> he told me he would put one thing into Fortnite that you wanted him to. Oh, wow. I want, one... Guess what? The one thing that I'm going to do is for my friend who loves Fortnite. Yeah. That's the one thing I'm going to do. You're going to do that? We'll, we'll make it a surprise. But he said that you could, do, you could give him one. So his daughter gave him a drawing, and they put they had their artist do a more Fortnite style version of the what drawing. Was it? I can't remember. It was a costume, and then they put it in was the it Fortnite. Was it the teddy bear one? I don't think it was the teddy bear one. It might have been. Um, but he he said if Dallin really wants to design something, we can uh, we can put it for it. Donald's the director of Fortnite. He lives up the road, um, and so he told me he said all right um, if Dallin wants to put one thing in, uh, tell him to get me a drawing. 
and then he'll have his artists do it. Now, you could do that. You could also ask him to put a turtle in, like as part of an environment that's indestructible, and it could just say indestructible turtle on it. <laughs> that just kind of crawls around in the swamp or is like a, a statue of a turtle that says the indestructible turtle. Uh, so, you know, think about that. You could also put, you could put a falcon on its shoulder to be your friend falcon, right? Yeah, he really wants, um, he really, he really, 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 really likes Fortnite. Yeah. So, and he, But did, he's he like, could already get the skin for the falcon from, from Marvel, right? Yeah. And he could be, he could be like the Marvel falcon. Yep. But. So we'll see. We'll see what we come up with. I thought you'd be excited about that. I forgot that I, yes, I, I didn't am tell excited you. About yeah, that. we'll have to come up with what okay, you're going to so, draw. So and what then... is the question? I need oh, yeah. questions. What's the question? Um, <clears throat> do you this is eat. It says yeti. Oh, oh. close. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it says dyslexia. Yeti. Yep. <laughs> um, what is you, a yeet? Do you plan on reading your dad's books? I don't know. Maybe yes. Um, probably yes. Um, probably yes. You might listen to audiobooks. Yes, I will. Um, because a um, good friend of mine in my writing group also has some reading disability. We're not sure exactly what it is. He just reads a lot slower than a lot of people. It might be undiagnosed with dyslexia. He's actually um, Layton, Professor Layton from uh, from the Arithmetist, and also Layton in Bridge Four. Um, you got And it you, might you just be he out? reads yeah okay. slow. Um, he listens to all the books and audiobook da, because, da, 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 da. you know, oh, Dad, reading is slow. But that, yeah, it just started to run out. Um, and so I don't, um, uh, yeah. So I one of those just, has a tiny line on it on the, where it says book of something. Do you want to sign it? Those usually get sent to people who are watching the stream who send in fan uh, mail or something like that. Um, Got it right there? Yeah. Yeah, whoever gets this is probably super lucky. Yeah. It's going to say banana on it. <laughs> so... Um, so if you send in fan mail to whatever the address is, Adam usually posts it in the, the thing. We won't be doing fan mail today because we have Dallin yeah. here, um, but often I will open it. You will have a chance of getting that. Okay. Yep. Physical fan mail um, that we can open on the stream. So uh, that's what you do with those, Kara, right? Sometimes you just slip that, one of those in the pen in yeah, uh, yeah. when there's fan. Not everyone will get one. We don't have enough for everybody. For but... Yeah. So wait, is, I just want more questions. Okay, yeah, you can answer questions here. Put this over on the table there. Okay. We have to do this in this weird way to social distance so that I can talk on stream without wearing a mask. So we have this big separation uh, thing that it's a little inconvenient, but not too bad. Uh, they want to know what superpower you would pick if you could have any superpower. Oh, I have one superpower, and it's totally one superpower, and it's called the power of all of them. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> no, it's not. If you weren't cheating, what superpower would you pick? I would choose the power of all of them. I already... Yes, if you can't it's, have that one. It's a power if, that gives you if, every single if power. If a genie comes to you and says, you can have one power, but it can't be cheating, it has to be one specific okay, power. Okay, then I'll do one that's not cheating. Uh-huh. Shape-shifting, so I can shape-shift into a person that has all the powers. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is what I live with all day. <laughs> They want to know what you do that annoys your dad the most. Oh. Uh, I don't know. You should probably ask my dad that question. What do you do that annoys me the most? I don't know. Um, you did, uh, my brother Jordan did give me a, uh, a fart gun for Christmas, right? Yes. That makes, from Minions, yes, that makes um, a fart noise. And that you uh, and Oliver appropriated that, and... Um, no, Joel did it. Joel. Was it Joel that was yeah, doing was Joel. that one? It was okay. Joel, because I was sick at the time. That's right. It was Joel. So I can't blame that one on you. Yes, he Let's can't see. blame it on me. What else? Um, you have a really... An There's one really annoying noise you make. Which the, one? The one's like a high-pitched scream. Oh. No, that's Joel's. I mean, no, that's, no, no. No, that's Oliver's. No, Oliver's. no, no. You, you do it like... Uh, it's like... It's one of... You do it in your games and stuff, where you're like... Wah! Oh, no, not that. It's like... <laughs> It's this one. That's not the annoying one, but there's another one that's a screech. Those are my two noises. <laughs> Those are your two noises. There's yeah. another noise. Um, Oliver does the one where he goes. You know, I would say the most annoying thing is when it's time for bed and you didn't eat dinner and then you're like, but I'm hungry. Can I have popcorn? <laughs> uh, can I have dessert right now? Like every time when it's time for bed, Down's yeah. like, okay, yeah, can I have dessert? Okay, can I have the dessert? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like nine thirty. You've like stayed up an hour past your bedtime. You're like, yeah, 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 dessert. And like, dude, 
Dessert? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're like, no popcorn. Dessert? Uh, yeah. Does ice cream count? We'd be like, eat something that's, uh, that's healthy. Does ice cream even count like, as dessert? Does, does ice cream count as healthy? No, ice cream's not healthy, but does it count as a dessert? Yes, it totally counts as a dessert. Oh. Does pie count as a dessert? Yes. But it's not cold. Yeah, well, it deserves to have to have you cold. Basically, anything you would pick, it would be a dessert. Okay, so that means a cheeseburger. You won't eat cheeseburgers. We have never gotten you to eat a cheeseburger. That's why I don't like cheeseburgers. Yes, it's not a dessert. If we called it a dessert, would you eat it? No. 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 If you called anything a dessert. I'll, Dallin, I'll eat this paper if you call it a dessert. Dallin doesn't I really would... like meat, right? No, I don't really like meat. I yeah. don't like it that much. Yeah. Chicken's fine, but I don't like... Really so am. we have to give him almonds and other things to get protein almonds. in him and some Well, I like ham. You do like ham. But I like almond. Yep. It's more. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't want like a cheeseburger or something like that. That's um, good. But he does like all things sweet. And for Halloween, he likes to make candy soup where he gets yes, all this Halloween candy, candy and mm -hmm. opens every bit of it. Uh, and opens, then, dumps it into one bowl, unless it's like liquid, then I don't Yeah, do it. And, and like the nerds go in there, and all the chocolate bars and everything, and you stir it up and you eat it with a spoon. Yes. Yep. It's so sugary. After you eat it, you have to drink a ton of water. <laughs> She's so sugar. Yes. And, and you don't need any help being hyper, right? Uh, you don't need sugar to be hyper. I need help being not hyper. Yes. <laughs> well, I can be not hyper. I can be yes. not crazy. I can be stuff, but I prefer... Dallin has a race car brain, um, which is what the... Uh, when he was diagnosed with ADHD, that's how they explained it. He has this brain that goes super fast and can fixate on one topic really hard and go... But it's also easy for you to get distracted sometimes. He's down the papers. Yes. Okay, he says so. as he gets distracted. All right, let's do like two more questions. All no, right? we, um, fifty more. No, we. If you want to come back on the stream, six hundred eighty-five. Six hundred eighty-five. You have to go gracefully when the time for your segment is up. What is your favorite movie? Movie. What's your favorite of the Marvel movies? The Marvel movies? Yeah. I don't have a favorite of the okay. Marvel ones. I don't really have a favorite movie. You watched like the Captain Underpants movie a bunch of times, right? Oliver watched that. Oh, that's more Oliver than you? That's Oliver. Okay. I don't know. Do you have a favorite YouTuber? Uh, you watch I don't really have a favorite YouTuber. Yeah. You watch more YouTube than you do movies or shows. But I play more games than You I play more today. games than anything. Oliver's really the one who spends a lot of time on YouTube, huh? I wish this said you. I You've been... This is, I, Dad, I thought that was an exclamation mark. What have you been playing lately? Uh, Minecraft and Halo and Spore. Oh, yeah, you love Spore. You've got definitely a favorite video game, right? Yes, Spore. Yeah, if anyone has any recommendations for video games with robust creature building or person building... Um, aspects to it. Uh, Dallin loves just building creatures in Spore and then letting them wander around in the world and No, you can like play that. as them and, and, you, can make them, them. and you can make yeah. them jump on top of random things. But it's things. the fact that you can create them yourself that makes it the most fun for yes. you, right? Yes, and I downloaded, I downloaded um, a picture of, you can, when you get um, Spore, there's like a picture onto your computer yep. that you get, so of uh, your creatures. So yes. I downloaded one of the creatures onto my school computer and I just put it on uh, all of my documents. Yep. Yep, and that's so, what I did. If anyone knows of anything like that with a robust creature building aspect, Dallin, would, uh, can I have that. 50 more? 50 more questions? No, you yeah. have one more question. But it's a Q&A. Yes, I know. It's a Q&A. Q&A is supposed to ask a lot of questions. Yes, and they did. They asked a lot of questions. Ask and answer. And That's what it's then we need to move answer. on and do do different things on the stream. What's, what's Dallin's final question? Um, they want to know if he's tried playing Ark. Ark? Oh, I can, Ark Survival something with that? Survival Evolve. Evolve. Uh, I'll take that as a yes. I'm well, they're not. familiar with it. Dallin okay. hasn't played it. No, Joel I, has it. I've seen um, my cousin play yeah. it. Ark is a, just a, uh, a touch to, like, hard. yeah, <laughs> one of the problems is um, any game with a lot of reading is going to be hard for Dallin. Yes. And Ark doesn't have a ton, but you it do have to... Wait, it has reading? Yeah, because you have to, all the crafting, you have to read what the things are and put the points in and with stuff. Minecraft, you don't have to read anything. That's true. Minecraft, you can just uh, you can just put on auto. I, stuff. You could you totally on... play Ark if you watch some Let's Plays that showed you how to do the things, right? Okay. Yeah. Ark, or if there's a, is there like a sandbox mode? 
Uh, in ARC, I think there is. I want uh, another question. <laughs> all right, one more. Uh, what is your favorite crustacean? I don't even know what that means. Okay, uh, let's see. What is a crustacean? Crustacean is the f group of animals that crabs are part of. Oh, group of animals that crabs are part of. Yeah. Oh, then I know what that is. And then... So... Um, like lobsters, crayfish. I know, crayfish. lobsters, crayfish, um, and those shrimp. Yep. And I know Mantis that. Mantis shrimp. Shrimp um, and crab. I like crabs. Duh, 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 Any duh, duh, specific crab type of crab? Oh, crab rave crabs? No, uh, no, I like blue lobsters as my favorite because blue they're lobsters. just cute. They're cute. Mm -hmm. Blue lobsters are my favorite. We're going to get a, an aquarium here soon. Salt Let's get a blue aquarium. lobster. Can we get a blue lobster? I don't lobster? think we can get a blue lobster. They're super expensive. Uh, well, and they also probably eat the fish, oh, I would yeah. guess. Yeah, they eat the fish. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Dallin. No, one more question. If you give you one more, will you go happily then? No. Okay, <laughs> bye-bye. No, I'll go maybe. No, yeah, no, maybe. no, you're going to no, have to make a deal. No, can I just have... You have to make a deal. Two more? Make a deal. Can I have two more? Two more? Yeah, two more. Two more questions and you won't complain? I won't yes, complain. because I have to go get full. Oh, okay. I won't so you got to hurry because you got to go. Okay, okay. You then. You can come watch yourself. Yes. Two, uh, two they, they want to know if you've played Terraria, and if so, if oh, like Terraria! It. I love Terraria. Yep, it's we've gotten fun. a lot of mileage uh, out of Terraria. Some of the best uh, money we've spent on video games to time ratio is Terraria. Uh, and it, it um, actually, change the time. No, no, meaning if we it only costs yeah, because five we bucks. can change it to Halloween if yes. we want to. That's we, so fun how you can change it to a different season. We only spent five bucks on it, and we played it for like hundreds of hours together in, in our world. Yes, we should play it again. Yes, they just added We still need to fight Duke earlier. Fishron. We can't beat Duke Fishron. He's so hard. We always die. Yeah. All right, and here's the final question. Final question. What is your favorite kind of music? Ooh, you just got a Google Home Mini to play music for you, so. Wait, set up? Uh, did we not set it up yet? Oh, we haven't set his up. Okay. Eh. Uh, I like digital music. It's like the music that has digital noises. Yeah, he, he basically likes um, uh, kind of pop electronica with um, uh, video game influences like yeah. the Fat Rat, right? Yeah. If you, Would be my... he's, he's, if you go on Spotify and search up the Fat Rat, it's a person who makes things, and yep. that's my favorite types yep, of music. Yeah, that's your favorite. I um, really like Plants vs. Zombies music, too. Yeah, and Oliver's is probably Perry Grip, right? Um, his favorite is from Just Shapes and Beats. Okay, of course. He's obsessed He's, with that game. He is obsessed. Yeah. Okay, well, it was fun Goodbye. having you. you. We will have you back for more meme and art reviews another time. Uh, thanks, Dallin. Bye. Bye, Dallin. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, that is um, a longer experience getting to know my son, Dallin. Uh, you have seen Dallin and Oliver recently. Joel does not like to be on screen, and uh, it, that is perfectly all right. Uh, he is invited if he wants to come on the stream, but he doesn't really feel like it. So um, he's uh, he's entered a, a stage where he's a little bit more self-conscious about things, um, being in front of people. Like <coughs> Dallin, um, really. Um, Dallin has no filter, and so the fact that his dad is semi-famous um, is a thing that comes up in conversation quite often with him. Um, but Joel, it, it's just uh, a little embarrassing, I think, to be, not embarrassing, wrong term. He doesn't like the attention, and he's kind of come to realize that, uh, that it makes him uh, feel a little shy. So he used to sit at my signings and hand out stickers and things to people uh, who are waiting in line. And nowadays, he would rather be behind the scenes helping out in other ways. He's actually writing a story for his English class. His English teacher signed them to write a two-page narrative, one to two-page narrative. Um, and so I'm, I helped him uh, come up with some, uh, an outline for that. It's a story from his D&D campaign oh. where he got turned into a frog. Um, and had to figure out how to try to help in the battle while being a frog. So there's some fun uh, frog hijinks, um, thematically appropriate. Uh, and people are wondering where uh, Jello is. Yep. So Jello is in his uh, aviary. Um, Jello, um, I will bring on weeks where I don't have a guest, uh, but only. These days, he can really only be here for a few minutes at the beginning. 
because he, uh, now that he can fly, um, and he is not very good at staying put. Uh, he's getting better, but when we come down here, and it's a new environment, when we have, uh, we do our, we're going to kind of build this out to be a more of a studio. Um, we will probably have like a jello section um, that he can be in, and it's possible that we'll be able to convince him to stay there, um, or that maybe we'll, we'll even put wire across the front so that he has to stay there. But in that case, he may just sit on it looking pathetic at us uh, the entire time. So, so uh, Marcus wants to know what Rosharan sporting events look like outside of Alethkar. What they look like outside of Alethkar. So um, Roshar, most places um, in Roshar, um, I would say they have not hit the, um, the point in society quite yet where mass sporting events are really a thing. Um, basically, sporting events are martial training during non-periods of war, even in the less martially focused um, places. Um, I would have to think about it. I haven't built any. Um, I mean, there are sports that were played non-martially on our earth, but even like the, uh, the ball game uh, in Mesoamerica had some pretty brutal aspects to it um, that is almost kind of a, um, a way to have a battle when you're not having a battle. Um, and so I think that the modern concept of sporting events, uh, the only place you're going to find that right now um, in the Cosmere's on Scadrille. Um, um, and Wayne accidentally started a sporting league. Um, I'm not sure if I'll get to that in the next book or not. But uh, if you remember in the last book where he was like, what, what we need is a way to get everybody drunk at the same time without them being drunk. Um, and uh, there are some implications and ramifications of that uh, for the uh, advents of uh, advent of professional sports, let's say. Uh, Backfire says, hello, first off. Oh, hello uh, back to you, Backfire. They, uh, they say, I find that I struggle with describing the layout of an area. For example, mm -hmm. buildings, rooms, and towns. Any tips? So, um, tip number one is the, the best descriptions tend to be ones that are doing double duty or triple duty. So, when you can describe and say something about your character, um, and when you can describe and say something about the tone of the uh, chapter or the scene as well, um, you always want to do that, right? The one of the, you, you need them occasionally. You sometimes just need the quick uh, outline of what's, what things look like and where everything is. Uh, but when you can inject a little more life into it, uh, do that. Um, and then remember that the reader, the, the point of this is characterization, setting the tone and the mood for the scene, but also to give some spatial awareness to the character. So describe it through the character's eyes. Assume you are doing, um, you're doing limited or even usually an omniscient. This is a good idea. And kind of keep their relationship in it, right? Like place them in the scene and highlight things that are going to be relevant uh, to how the character is moving and interacting and, um, and things like that. And keep your focus on that. Uh, you don't need to do um, a really long establishing shot description of an entire town. Um, if what's important in the town is that the character is, say, um, visiting one of the outer cities and they're seeing how people are starving here and whatnot, um, you know, how, having them stroll down the center of the town that should be bustling with people, and uh, instead it's, it's kind of quiet and ghostly. Like, you can pick up that image in your head with only a couple of sentences, um, and then you add what's relevant. If there's a well at the center of town, you know, walking to the, to the well and looking down, hearing the voice echo, and seeing that there's, you know, the well is run dry, sets the mood, the tone, and it puts the character spatially there in the middle of the town um, next to something, and there's probably open space around them because it's a town square or something, right? Like, that's the important 
uh, element to it, and you don't need to go further than that. Now, some people's styles are more descriptive, and that's totally fine. You may find that you prefer to have the big, long, establishing shot descriptions, but those are the tips I'd say. Keep in mind, relationship to the character spatially is what the reader really wants out of that scene, and that what you want out of that scene is to add characterization and mood um, setting in addition to just describing the scene. Um, Matt Thomas from Facebook is asking for a baby boy name. Cool. A baby boy name? I, you know, I'm a partial to Adam for no reason. Oh, yeah? Just it's, it's God and I that are partial to that name. Yes, well, <laughs> I've never heard you use that one before. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a nice one to have, uh, to, have, uh, to have in your back pocket there. God's uh, favorite name. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, so um, I would say... Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Then, he, then he found something better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, if you're counting on God to name your children, uh, you might, you know, remember that I, Isaiah's children's names are totally in the running, right? The, um, like, we will be desolate or no, a remnant re will return or whatever, and things like that, so keep that in mind. Um, and with me, you have to be in danger of me giving you a silly name. Um, when I always tried to convince my cousin, Jeremy, who is a, Jeremy is a wonderful person, and he is very trusting, maybe a little too trusting to be uh, around me, because I persuaded him that I was going to name my first child Zabinus, XZ, after my uh, d and character. Uh, and Jeremy totally believed it, which actually might say something more about me than it does about him. Um, he was very shocked when my first child was named Joel. That's a good name. I have always been partial to the name Kaladin. Let's, sit, let's point that out. Um, uh, but um, what am I feeling for a non-weird boy's name. Xavier? Xavier is what I feel like right now. It's got a nice sci-fi fantasy uh, implication. I like names that have an X in them. They just, you know, don't end up getting used as much, uh, particularly starting with the X. Um, it's a perennial favorite, and so they, you know, won't be made of fun of too much in school. So, Xavier, that's what I'm feeling right now. There you are. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, maybe? Yeah, well, maybe, yes. Maybe congratulations are, are, uh, are in order, or maybe not. We, we do, you can look up and see how many baby Kaladins there are uh, using the census data and things like that, which is kind of fun. There's a lot of them. There are a lot of baby Kaladins. Yep. Uh, it is nice to have some names like that that, that work uh, both in English and Alethi. Um, they're, you know, as much as we all love the books, probably not um, a lot of Frodo's and Bilbo's running around that really appreciate having that name. Strider works much better um, as a Lord of the Rings name. I have met a number of Arwens, which were, also works very well. Quill's middle name is Strider. Yeah, Strider. Yeah, Alan, or Adam has given a name, Strider, to a... I Child of his. Yeah, he has a very nerdy name. I like yep. to break it down because Quill yeah. is a pen and I'm a fake writer. <laughs> uh, and then. And I, Peter Quill. And Peter Quill. Yes. And then I love the nickname Q, which is yes. reference to James Bond and mm -hmm. Star Trek. And then the, Strider obviously is yep. super nerdy. I call him Barbecue. <laughs> yep. He is the baby Q. Dallas is now in the chat. Oh dear. <laughs> oh no. Oh, Dallin, don't, don't derail my chat too much, Dallin. <clears throat> um, Mateo says, uh, going off of something we were talking about earlier, yes. uh, what is one way to justify having multiple prologues in one book? Uh, you don't need to justify it. If you want it, do it, right? Um, understand that uh, even a single prologue makes your learning curve go steeper and having multiple prologues then just steepens the learning curve even further. But it's, you know, Robert Jordan had only one prologue to his books, but he started doing them at like 70,000 words, basically novel length, because uh, he wanted to touch on all the side characters in the prologue and then jump into the main narrative in his later books. And, you know, that's a cool thing I haven't seen anyone else do. 
it became a defining feature of some of those later books, which I think is great. Um, so you don't need a justification, but you do need to understand what the cost is. And it's that learning curve, right? Um, why did I do it in Stormlight Archive? Well, I wanted to basically have a prologue to the series and a prologue to the book, right? Um, and that's why I gave myself two. Um, but really, there's three, because then there's a prologue to the character, right? Um, and why do we write things as prologues? The mental difference between a prologue and a chapter one to a reader is generally going to be, they're going to like, all right, prologue is going to be separated in time and or character from the main narrative somehow. And so they will invest less in a prologue. And sometimes that's what you want them to do. This is why it's kind of a cliche, um, but a lot of uh, prologues, uh, particularly earlier in the genre, were from the viewpoint of someone who dies. And you saw it as a pro prologue, you're like, oh, I know not to invest maybe too much into this character um, because um, they're probably not long for this world. Um, but the prologue will put that distance between your reader and the book. And that's part of why it steepens the learning curve. The reader knows, I can't attach too much um, to this. And so doing that several times um, is going to just detach that even further. Um, because the reader knows you're not doing a prologue unless there's some reason you're not starting the main narrative yet. And you could have lots of artistic reasons for not starting the main narrative yet. Uh, for me, with the Stormlight Archive, it was partially a way of saying, strap in for the long haul, right? Um, this book is four times as long as uh, uh, most other books, and it's going to have um, lots of setup and lots of excellent payoff, and you just are going to have to trust me. And the prologues are kind of reinforcing that idea in The Way of Kings. If people put that book down, it is often somewhere in the, or if they, if they don't like the book, right? Um, it's somewhere in those opening chapters, um, first 12. Um, and that's just an aspect of that book, and it's the piece of art I wanted to make. But it is also the thing that makes it the hardest to get into. The, the, biggest, the biggest drawback of the book is probably that it has that steep learning curve. Um, so, yeah, justify it however you want. Just make sure it's the piece of art you're wanting to tell. Uh, Jory says, have you ever seen a writing prompt online and said, I need to fulfill this prompt? Or is there one you wish you had fulfilled but never got around to? Uh, no, but I see a lot of them, and a story starts. Um, the issue is with me is there, there are no... Um, there are no... There's no need for extra story prompts, right? Um, I have so many things waiting in the wings that I want to write. Um, I see very cool ones, and they do sometimes inspire ideas and whatnot. Um, but I've never been really a story prompt type person um, because I don't do writing sprints um, and things like that. Um, and so I think a lot of them are cool. Um, I think of them more often than I see one that I want to write something uh, according to. Um, Sean says, would children on Roshar be taught the names of the different sprint in school like kids with animals on our world? Oh, yeah, definitely. Good idea. I bet that they would. Um, they would also probably read the book Where's My Chull, apparently, that fans have made. But um, it's, it's a spoof off of a Terry Pratchett book. Um, but yes, uh, definitely Spren would, be, uh, would probably be like learning to say kitty um, around here. Or, you know, Hoyd would say they probably would learn to say, ew, yucky crab thing. Uh, Daniel says, did the uses of epigra epigraphs in the Robotech novels influence your own usage of epigraphs? I can't say. I didn't, wouldn't even be able to remember that they did have them. Um, I know I like them. Um, if I were going to point toward one, I'd point toward Dune. Um, because though I read all the Robotech books as a kid and really liked them, uh, Dune I read during a more formative time of m in my writing. Um, you know, my, after I decided I wanted to be a writer and was really looking at the structure of stories and things like that. So that's probably the one I would point to. Um, and the, the epigraphs in Dune um, are very, you know, they're ephemera, they're very similar, though they all tend to be from the same piece, I believe. I think they're all from the journal. Um, but um, 
that could have had an unconscious influence, right? There are a lot of great books that use epigraphs, but I would not have been able to tell you if they had. Like, I can't even remember the author's name of those. It's like Jack or something like that. Um, and so I, I read them when I was probably Dallin's age. Um, well, no, a little bit later, because I had started reading by that point. Uh, so I, I was 14 or 15. Um, my brother, I think, still has them all. Um, Kathy might be in the chat and say if he does, but... Unfortunately, she is. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They all were his. He kept them on his bookshelf um, in a nice, neat row. Um, but we did enjoy playing the Robotech um, uh, RPG as well. We played quite a bit of that. It was the, um, um, in the, the Palladium system. Um, and Palladium had a lot of really fun games that... They tried to make work together with a book called Rifts, and it never, they never all worked together as well as we wanted them to, but it was a lot of fun. Um, we liked th That would, was probably our favorite system um, when we were young, except I really, really liked the West End Star Wars game, um, the, the Die 6 one. Um, Nick says, Religious, religion is an important theme in your books, but can be tricky to define. Do you have a de definition of religion that you use? Does it differ depending on the book? Uh, it de differs depending on the person, right? Um, one of the things that taught me this is whether you call Confucianism a religion or not. Um, there are a lot of belief systems that um, different practitioners would look at differently. Is this a religion? Is it not? Um, I think a religion needs to be defined by its members as a religion. Um, I, I let the people who are, who are experiencing the thing define the thing. Um, and in that regard, um, I think that most people I know uh, who are Confucian-influenced would not call it a religion, but a, si a system of, of government and organization and a system of thought. Um, but I know other people who might say, yeah, Confucianism is a religion. It's just not one with a being you worship um, and things like that. So um, it's, I would leave it to the characters to define. Uh, and Kathy checked with Jordan and he still has them. Awesome. Jordo still has them. So uh, Flightbug says when writing in scenes, if the setting changes slightly, is that a different scene or does that imply the scene can be reduced? Um, so this is probably too strong a screenplay line of thinking. Um, as an author, I rarely think um, so specifically, right, about did, did, did the scene just change or whatnot. Um, it, it really just depends, right, as the conversation moved on to something else, as a new event happening. Um, and I don't even really think in scenes so much as um, movements, right, like in a piece of music. Um, where during this one, I'm kind of focusing on this and I'm moving into another movement where the tone is going to shift. And if it's a start shift, often if that's an end of a chapter and start of a new one, right? Um, but sometimes if it's a slow shift and we're going to you know, move from the, the adagio into the largo or whatever, um, boy, my, my music theory stuff has been a long time away. Uh, it's a long time away in college, but you know, you're just going to move between different sections of music. You're going to be fast and you're going to be slow for a while. And are, those are different movements, but right where one starts or stops in a book, harder to define, I would say, than, than saying, you know, that's a scene, that's a scene. Uh, obviously, if you make a, a line break and you do what a, an official scene break, you can define that as scene, but even most scenes that are encapsulated by a chapter or a section uh, line break set off has several little movements in it where um, there's, we often, for instance, start in a kind of an establishing shot and then kind of sweep into the character's viewpoint and then um, move into a conversation or an argument and that argument rotates around an idea um, and then either parts or changes into a different kind of discussion or argument as there's a meeting of minds or whatnot, and that's a change also. And then you kind of, even in a conversation, oftentimes you're moving in and out of 
bursts of conversation and bursts, bursts of either uh, characters responding internally to the conversation or to more happening in the setting and then you move back into the conversation. Um, and so I don't really think and say, obvious scene right here, unless I'm putting the, the pound sign, which is the manuscript format way of saying line break, um, and actually breaking the scene. Um, it's more, there, there's, this is done more on gut than on, uh, even for someone like me, this is a structure guy, on structure. Um, does it feel right? Are the transitions good? I'm much more concerned with transitions between different parts of a chapter than I am on what, how I define this chunk versus this chunk. Uh, Dr. Word Person mm. says, any advice for easing the reader into a fantasy world when it's based on the geography, when, when it's based on the geography, history, customs of a place that is not Western Europe? Yes. Um, so... Yeah, lots of tips. There are just so many different ways to do this. Um, I think that one thing you can do is identify um, a few things that are distinctive, that are going to be different from what you assume your average reader's experience to be, and kind of highlight those things. Uh, center the scene around them, right? Um, like, I mean, the Mulan cartoon, uh, which is a fantastic... Uh, screenplay does a really good job of this, setting up both character and expectations for the character through using scenes like the tea pouring ceremony, which is something that might be unfamiliar to a lot of uh, the Western audience of this. And you never have to have it really explained to you um, because the scene rotates around it. And doing some things like this that are going to establish you know, are there rigid roles for different people in this society? Um, um, do they have a different type of mythology or, um, or you know, religious feel? Again, Milan's a great example of that. You know, uh, going in and praying to the ancestors, which would be a very unusual experience for a lot of uh, people who are uh, members of a traditional Western religion, right? Um, and these things are done very elegantly in that screenplay and just doing things like that. I mean, the, the easy way is to have a Watson character, right? Someone who comes from a different society. It doesn't have to be necessarily even like our own, but that can be a window into understanding these things. But it's actually a lot easier without that than you might think. Um, use that only if it makes sense for your narrative. Otherwise, um, show what's important to the people of your, of your setting, and the reader will get it. They will pick up on it. Um, the things you have to be careful are, um, are if things are, uh, if expectations are wildly different, right? Um, this is the, uh, this is the, the, I often share the story of reading a book where one, um, it was a nonfiction book, where someone was hypothesizing that horses were not strong enough to carry people on their backs until they'd been bred a certain amount, and the, prevalen the prevalence of chariots would like, um, would, that's one of the reasons to explain why so often chariots came before or whatnot. Uh, it's been a long time since I read that piece, but it really just kind of sparked an idea in my head of, of a world with horses that were smaller, right? They're a horse, but, uh, you know, a child, basically they had only ponies, and even if they were larger horses, they did not have the back strength to carry someone. And that book, it was really hard, that's Dragon Steel, um, to get across to readers um, that people couldn't ride on the backs of horses because the characters would never think of doing that because they know that it would hurt the horse. And even if I mention that, uh, readers still reading occasionally will be like, why aren't they just climbing on the backs of the horses? Uh, why does it matter so much that a wheel is broken or whatnot? Just get on the horse and ride it. Um, and I use that more as a metaphor rather than saying, you know, this one thing, which I don't even know if that um, anthropologist that was talking about this was accurate or not um, in our world. But the idea that if people have certain expectations, uh, you may have to work extra hard to disabuse them of those expectations. And what I didn't know as a younger writer that I now know is that centering a scene um, or a conflict or um, a setting piece around this idea really will help cement it in the reader's mind. Um, and then they'll be like, oh, OK, this, you know, I remember this scene stuck with me because it wasn't just set dressing. It was the characters having 
uh, an important moment interacting with their culture because of this thing. Um, and so suddenly you could use the broken wheel as an, a way to remind and reinforce in the reader's mind rather than making it an effect later on that they have to remember um, things that I've explained that I didn't explain very well in order to understand what's going on. That makes any sense. I kind of talked around in circles a little bit on that one. But um, it is, you know, one of the grand skills. In fact, in my class, I call it the grand skill of being a sci-fi fantasy writer is the ability to evoke culture, character, and all of these things through your descriptions and through the simple line-by-line -line writing of your story without it being boring. Uh, this is something you should be practicing regardless of what type um, of real-world inspiration you're drawing upon. Um, because in a sci-fi fantasy book, you're going to make it, um, so there's going to be differences. It's probably going to be on a fantastical world in some way. And so you're going to have to be able to do this. Uh, even if you're writing a vampire story set in our world, right? Your vampire is going to behave different. They might sparkle. They might not. Uh, you're going to have to establish in the reader's mind how things work for your characters. And this is just a great thing to practice. Uh, Trave says, what is your absolute favorite monster or alien that you've created over the years? Oh, monster or alien that I've created over the years? <laughs> Picking my favorites out of my own work is really hard um, for me. Um, so, um, but I do like things like the Chasm Fiends and whatnot. Um, like, I, I like, I like having a mythological uh, bestiary that really fits the setting that I'm doing, um, that I'm writing in. And um, I like how a lot of them work with the spren and the ecology and all of this stuff. And so, um, gasm scenes, but in general, kind of that whole line of beasties in uh, the Stormlight Archive. Uh, N1 E1 says, which do you like more, philosophy or science? Um, I would say, <sighs> depends on my mood. Um, and, you know, the, the glib answer is they're the same thing. I see no difference between these two things, right? We were doing memes earlier, so. Um, but the non-glib answer is I like um, the ideas of philosophy more, but I do not like reading philosophy more because the philosophers were almost uniformly terrible writers, in my opinion. Um, and I argued with my philosophy professors about this a lot that I'm like, being obtuse on purpose does not make you sound smarter. It just makes your ideas more difficult for people to understand. And uh, I don't really blame them for this because most of them are writing in a time when you know, they didn't have access to modern conventions of clarity and things like this. But the entire philosophy profession, if you will, um, has deeply rooted in it that this is how you write in an intelligent way and even modern philosophy or you know contemporary philosophy even you'll read it and you'll be like why are you writing like this um it's it's 500 words and it's one sentence <laughs> um it doesn't like you have really interesting ideas maybe try explaining them rather than trying to show how smart you are by not explaining them um and so you hit maybe a a, a nerve there of science reading tends to actually be even though it's you know you would think the scientists are going to write poorly um there are a lot of really, really great science writers out there. Asimov was one of them. Um, and that, like, it's like scientists are like, we really want everyone to understand this stuff because it's so cool and important to us. And they try really hard to make it so that, um, that you will, when you read it, you will be, be as excited as they are. And there are all these science professionals that try to do that, where the philosophers all seem like if they can't understand it, then they don't deserve to understand it. Um, and they weren't meant to ha be having the privilege of reading my brilliant ideas anyway. Um, and that's just kind of baked into the traditions of the philosophy. So there you go. Little, little mini rant from Brandon on it. Uh, there, there are a whole bunch of terrible writing with great ideas <laughs> in philosophy. Um, many are asking what your favorite monster in general is. And I have a guess. You have a guess. It is indeed the dragon. Okay. Yes. Is that what you were going to guess? That's not what I was going to guess. Oh, what were you going to guess? Because I don't really classify them as monster, oh, okay. I guess is what it comes down to. I was going to guess Cthulhu. Okay. Well, I mean, Cthulhu is not a monster either. Cthulhu is, is an elder god. Oh. Yes. Um, right. 
Um, like you'd have to pick a Shugoth if you're going to pick a Cthuloid monster or something like yeah. that. Uh, but I do like uh, the Cthulhu mythos. Um, I think it is, it is interesting, but what is more interesting is how we have interacted and interfaced with it um, as a society um, is really interesting to me. Uh, I really like stories that make use of it in an interesting way like Bloodborne did and stuff like that. Uh, favorite dragon? Favorite dragon? Uh, uh, Anne McCaffrey's dragons. Um, probably um, the white dragon Ruth. Is that? Um, yeah. So I very much um, loved those dragons in those books and still do have read them recently to do a an introduction to one of them. And man, Anne's writing just holds up. It's some of some of Anne's prose you read and you're like, man, that is just really good stuff. Um, and that doesn't, you know, the, the um, what is it, Joe Walton, who says, uh, sometimes the, uh, the things that you loved as a child get visited by the suck fairy. I think this is Joe Walton, where it's better to not go uh, and read them again because the suck fairy is visited and made them suck all of a sudden. And when they were really awesome, but that suck fairy just is, is relentless. And so some things that you loved as a child, it's best to just let, uh, let lie and enjoy the fact that they used to not uh, suck. I don't actually, I think it's fun to talk about it. It's a really fun way of saying it. Um, I think it's a little uh, dismissive of us sometimes to say that um, certain things that were, are enjoyed by a different audience um, that perhaps we are no longer part of are that the term for that is suck. Um, I think that it, we are too dismissive in society of things that people that are younger than us like as if trying to devalue their opinion and their passion and uh, the things they like simply because they are young and because we don't like them. Uh, they, people are not less valuable as people because they are 11 um, than, and the things that they like, they can like just as much as the things that I like. Um, and yeah, I, I think we are too dismissive uh, of the fact that human beings like something and their liking of it uh, gives it value. How about that? I think that's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. so you see, I've been visited by that fairy, though. Yes, it does happen. Anyway, um, Ramba Rao says, what is your favorite character archetype or personality type that you haven't used in one of your books? Ooh, character archetype or personality type I haven't used? Wow. Boy. Um... I haven't done a real cool traditional uh, revenge narrative um, with the, um, the, in the kind of Count of Monte Cristo way, right? Where the, uh, basically this is the, um, the mistaken identity story that is, if you guys have read um, the Miles Vorkosigan books, except done more intentionally, where uh, instead of like in those, like the Vorkosigan uh, early books and um, whatnot, it's, a person who gets in over their head and has to lie about who they are and what their experience is in order to try to stay ahead of the lies that they've already told so that people won't discover that they aren't indeed the person that they say. Uh, a Bug's Life is a great example of this, right? Um, and that one is usually played for comedy, though, in um, Verkosigan books. It's not done very well by Lois Bujold. Um, there's a different archetype of the, this, which is kind of the um, Knight's Tale is this, for, this thing, and so is um, Mount Count of Monte Cristo, where it's a person, I shouldn't, Cristo, let's make sure I say that right. Um, um, and that, um, where an intentional deception of those around you in order to achieve an, a, a near impossible goal. Um, I would say that my favorite story of that archetype is Gattaca. Um, which I just love. I think it's a fantastic movie. Um, and I've never done that, uh, that specific style of story. Um, and I fully intend to someday. Um, I mean, Gattaca being one of my favorite movies would, would be a, uh, a clue. I tend to take the things that I love, but I, ha I haven't found the exact right place for it yet, let's say. I don't know if that's a character archetype so much as a um, different types of character can be put into this archetype of a, of a story. But uh, anyway, 
If you guys haven't read um, haven't read uh, the Brokosikin books, um, particularly with the Brothers in Arms, I think Brothers in Arms is the first one with Miles. There's one about his parents before. Um, they're uh, they're quite good. And if you haven't watched Gattaca, yes, if you haven't it's Gattaca, very underappreciated. It is. Yeah, it, it's it, kind of a cult classic. It, but I would say that it's it is underappreciated. It's one of those things that I think is well appreciated in the community, but not by enough people, right? I don't think Gattaca is underrated by people who watch science fiction films, particularly um, harder science fiction and things like that. It is not as well appreciated by people that would appreciate it if they seen it, right? It's not as known. It's this, this weird thing where you say something is underappreciated, and it means two things. Sometimes it means um, people have been down on it too much. Speed Racer is my example of that, right? I think Speed Racer is a great movie. Um, I think the Wachowskis just did a, that's just a, if you accept it for what it is, which I did on first viewing, it is just wonderful, but it has like a 20% Rotten Tomatoes. That is one style of underappreciated. I think the other style is something like Gattaca that is generally re well regarded and lauded by the community and those who have seen it, but uh, could de deserve a larger audience because it is a fantastic movie. And it holds up well for how yeah. old it is. Yeah, it really does. Anyway, um, Finn Rear Lives says, can you give the pros and cons of delivering exposition through character dialogue versus internal thought? Yeah. And what situation calls for which? So, um, couple things on this. So, dialogue is generally going to be longer, right? Um, this is the, the kind of pyramid of distraction I talk about in my class. Um, you can almost always use more words to do something better in a story. Dialogue is generally going to be better. Why is this? It's a lot easier to, number one, um, have multiple personalities involved in the exposition. By showing what confuses one character and doesn't confuse a, another, or what one person thinks is an atrocity and another person thinks is just the normal way of life. These sorts of things, particularly when you involve like three characters, can just get a ton of characterization um, on the page in a way that is easy to read and fun, but takes more time. Takes up a lot more page length to do it. And um, if you do it poorly, uh, it's way more noticeable, I would say. Um, people are used to kind of the boring info dump in narrative, and they will read it, accept it what it is. It's, it's like, you know, um, doing it in dialogue, you can end up with a 1 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10, and a narrative dump is usually like a 3, right? Uh, so you can't always, you can't get below. Now, you can move that 3 up in narrative. We'll talk about narrative in a bit. Um, but in dialogue, you can get that 10 out of 10 where you just have a fantastic sequence of dialogue that is doing exposition that is also setting tone. It's explaining about characters. Um, and it's, it can be funny, or it can be infuriating, and it can cause all these different emotions. Um, and uh, really great dialogue writers, this is like where they shine. Um, but it's going to be longer. Uh, and there are times where um, you just don't want to take that much time. And then where it goes wrong is when you're doing kind of the, um, the maid and butler dialogue, right, where characters are explaining things that they already know to each other that both of them know. And that can turn into a one really quick where the reader's just like, oh, this is so unskilled um, and so on the nose and whatnot that they're just like out. Um, now, narrative can be long still, um, but you have... Generally, you can do it shorter in narrative. Um, you can do just the bare bones outline where you're like, you know what, I just need to give people this information in three lines. Um, it's, it, and you'll find it in every, um, every published book where the author's like, yeah, I could do a, set up a whole scene to explain this world element in a really interesting and engaging way, but I just did that with three world elements. And you just need to know uh, this race of aliens looks like, um, you know, Bats. They just look like bats, and they have you know arms with uh, with um, with uh, skin you know between the arm and the body. Done. Two lines. You're like, okay, alien species looks like bats. Got it. Um, and you know, rather than having a big discussion about their their culture um, and things like that, or having them meet one and be like, whoa, what are you? And they're like, whoa, what are you? You can just do it in a couple of lines. Um, why would you want to do that? Like I said, you, you just, number one, having a variety of these things isn't ever bad. Um, 
and sometimes you just need to get that information across. Um, if it's a long expository dump, you can, in narrative, put it very much in voice. A little easier in first person, and so you can do it in a really fun way. Uh, the poster child for this is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? Um, wonderful, delightful narrative pieces that talk about the world um, in the form of the Hitchhiker's entries, which are both ephemera, humor, they're the funniest parts of the book, um, and they are delivered with excellent comedic timing, plus they tell you about the world and set the tone, right? Um, you can just do things like that. You can, you can do in, uh, in, in narrative, you can have the line, you know, the, the Vogon ship hung in the air, it's not a Vogon ship. The ship hung in the air in the exactly, in the, exactly the way that a brick wouldn't. Someone else can quote it actually the right way. Um, but that's from Hitchhiker's Guide. Just one of the most brilliant lines of description in any book ever. right? And it doesn't tell you anything about a character. What it does is it sets the mood, sets the tone, gives you a really cool image, and makes you laugh. Um, and that's just way easier to do in narrative. Um, so they, they're just different tools. Ten minutes, Adam's telling me. They're just different tools. Uh, and so practice with both of them. Find out what, uh, what you specifically want. Ooh, Scam Likely is calling me again. Sounds urgent. Yes, very urgent. I don't have, know how to hang up on this phone like a, as easily as my other one. Um, I wish I could make it on Android. Maybe the Android whizzes there can tell me how to make it so that if the phone thinks it's Scam Likely, to just not buzz, right? There is a way? Great. I'll, I'll have Kara just do it to my phone. I, I just thought the other day, there's probably a way that I can just, because they're all different numbers. You could take a specific number and make it not buzz, but yeah. Um, I don't answer my phone. Uh, I, I talked about this on stream, I believe. If you, if you happen to find my phone number, I will not answer. Um, I just don't answer my phone unless it's a scheduled call or if it's from my wife. So um, I suspect. I am not unusual in that regard. These days, that's just how everybody is now. Um, we text each other, right? Um, and I think a year ago I read something yeah. about 2020 mm -hmm. that they expected 50% of all calls to be scam calls. So it's not unlikely that most I would, people don't yeah. answer their phone. Because I don't get called very much. Um, and I, I did this even before I had scam likely as an excuse. Um, but I would say mine, it's 90% scams. Um, I don't know because I've never answered them because I don't answer my phone. So uh, I wish I could turn like voicemail off that, that had a message but didn't let people leave a recording where it just said, I'm not going to listen to this recording. Uh, call my assistant. Uh, here's his phone number. Uh, bug him. If it's important, he will get to me. Well, but, I think we did create it. It says that, but yeah. then they can leave a message yeah. anyway. So I always have the new message waiting thing mm -hmm. on my phone. Oh, I uh, you. And you can't get rid of it. It's yeah. just there. And I'm like, I'm never going to listen to these new messages. Um, sorry. Uh, Godzilla or King Kong? Godzilla or King Kong? Uh, and I'm not sure if they're asking yeah. favorite or what. Who would your, win or favorite, or right? Yeah, for the movie. Um, so I got to give it to Godzilla. Um, for uh, for movie series, though I really appreciate King Kong and both versions, um, Peter Jackson's, um, from one long-winded author to another. That was a, that was a beast of a film, um, <laughs> but um, I think they're great. But there's just such uh, the cultural impact of Godzilla, how earnest those movies are, um, how much it brought a different cinema tradition to a lot of uh, people in the world, and just how interesting the history of Godzilla is as a film um, thing. If I had to sit down to watch one of the two, I would probably watch Peter Jack or one of any of them, I'd watch Peter Jackson's King Kong, right? Um, or one of these new ones. Some of these new ones have been good, the, the new kind of uh, franchise that they're doing. Um, but, um, if I have to say which one I'm more glad exists in the universe, it is Godzilla, and I will always have fun watching a Godzilla movie. Um, so, uh, who will win uh, Godzilla? I mean, one, you know, King Kong is cool, inspired a whole video game franchise about a plumber. Um, he's, you know, they've made him plenty big in the, the new things. But the other one is a radioactive dinosaur that can shoot lasers and stuff. I mean, 
it, it, it's, they have to make it a contest to have a film, but uh, I think everybody knows who should win in King Kong versus uh, Godzilla. And neither of them are going to win, so they yeah. can make a sequel. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's like, who would win in a foot race between The Flash and Superman? Guess what? They never say. It's happened like 20 times in the comics, and always some villain has, has rigged it somehow, or they've been interrupted, or they, um, yeah, um, which is the silliest thing because they should totally just let Flash win because he's got like one thing, right? He's the Flash. Let him be a specialist, but Superman's so much more popular that they can't offend the Superman fans by letting Superman win. So anyway, um, that, they're cowards. At cowards, I say, let the Flash win. Uh, do you want to finish that stack? Or yeah, I'll finish the stack. Okay. Yeah. Um, New York or Chicago style pizza? Uh, I like both. Uh, now I would probably pick. Boy. Um, so here's the thing um, New York style versus Ch Chicago style are also very different things from getting a piece of pizza in New York and getting a piece of pizza in Chicago. If I could transport one to me right now, I would say Chicago. Um, but if I'm going to get what regular pizza joints consider Chicago style and New York style, I'm probably going to order the New York style because it's more consistently good outside of New York, in my experience, um, than Chicago style done outside of Chicago because neither of them really quite taste like the actual ones. Um, but the New York style outside of New York tastes a lot closer than the Chicago style uh, does outside of Chicago. Um, I'm going to rephrase a question from Kaylin. Okay. Um, they're looking for advice for when they feel like, or for when you feel like your book is stalled. Book is stalled. So I talked a little about this earlier. Um, try shaking it up by having a new character. Um, do the scene that you were planning to write. Put it in a new location. Uh, have a new um, small conflict arise. But if the whole book is stalling, um, number one piece of advice is write it anyway, right? Uh, it might be you, it might not be the book. Indeed, um, for a lot of authors, it is you, not the book, meaning the book is fine. You're going to figure out, and if there is a slow part, you're going to fix it in revisions. Um, and it's more important to just push through right now and give yourself the practice of finishing things that you need. Um, that said, um, for me, I'd say one out of four or five times um, that there is something legitimately wrong with the book. And if it stalls out for me, it's because either um, I've hit a section that is just legitimately not interesting enough and I needed to rethink that part of the book, or I've, I've put something in the book that I'm making worse and worse by writing it, like a character arc that I know isn't working, and each chapter furthers that character arc in a direction away from where the, the character should be. I just don't know what the character should be. And in those cases, I will go back to outline, and I will go uh, back to writing fundamentals and ask myself what's wrong here. Uh, I recommend that not be done for most new writers um, until you've finished a few books. Um, I recommend pushing forward and finishing it anyway. Um, it is possible that you didn't put enough into your book but that's not really as much a thing. Like, yes, books tend to be better when you combine multiple cool ideas into one book rather than trying to take one idea and milk it as far as you can. But there is infinite drama and excitement to be had from simple character interactions uh, and character um, conflicts, internal and external, uh, to the point that um, if the book is really stalled, chances are good that you just don't have the experience yet as a writer to write blindly forward, trusting that your mind will eventually learn how to fix this. And the way to get that skill is to write. Um, and so um, go take a notebook. Um, go out to your favorite bookstore or coffee shop. Don't uh, take your computer. Don't let yourself check Twitter. Um, write longhand and force yourself to write that next scene. Um, in a new location for yourself, or just have it from a different character's viewpoint. I mean, write it from the table's viewpoint. I don't care. Do whatever it takes that feels really weird to you that's going to jostle you out of this funk that you're in, and just write it, and then rewrite it after you finish the book. 
when you get to you, you'll smile and be like, all right, that's the chapter I wrote from the table's viewpoint. That's real weird. That can't stay in, but sure was fun. Uh, Flightbug says, when writing multiple viewpoints, how do you know when to switch between the different viewpoints? This is go You can reference back to when I was talking about scene earlier. This is generally based on instinct for me, and there are a couple of big players in this. First off is um, which person's narrative needs progress, right? Who haven't I touched on recently and I need to make uh, some progress on? For me, I like jumping between characters, uh, between chapters, rather than doing big, huge chunks by one chapter and or character, and then big, huge chunks by another character. And in that case, it's just like, who haven't I seen for a little bit, uh, and who um, who needs the the most progress at this point? Um, if it's going to be multiple characters in a scene and choosing who it's going to be, then it gets a, a little more interesting because. I'll have to ask myself, who's going to have the most interesting observations about this scene? Um, like sometimes the character you're not expecting, seeing through their eyes to compare the other two main characters um, interacting for the first time can be really golden because you can say so much about all three characters with a fresh set of eyes on them, uh, metaphorically speaking. Uh, but sometimes it's who's going to act the most, right? You want generally your viewpoint protagonist for a scene to be the, uh, the person who has the most at stake and who is changing things, uh, who is protagging, as Howard Taylor would say, um, <laughs> protagging the most at the moment. Um, and what you don't want to do is generally have the person who's just standing around observing. That said, I specifically set a scene in Rhythm of War, not from the viewpoint uh, of either of the characters. This is the scene that happens in a certain battle tent that, uh, that, it, that Dalinar is watching unfold. Because in that case, the mystery of what was going to happen and the tension of it was stronger in Dalinar's uh, viewpoint because he didn't know how it was going to play out. And he was able to have powerful emotional responses to it and get taken surprised by it in the same way that the reader was. Um, and in that case, I did what normally goes against the rule of thumb. I did not set it in the eyes of either of the th any of the three characters who are participating in this particular kind of conflict. And I let him give an external uh, observation of it. Be careful not to do that too much, but once in a while, it can add some really interesting dynamics. Um, I also um, do some things where if I have a, um, a book that has a lot of viewpoints, generally this is the Stormlight books right now. Um, I will structure the novels in such a way that, um, that I only use a limited number of viewpoint characters in a given chunk of the book. Um, this is because in a big series like Stormlight, um, there's a danger of every time you jump to a character, forgetting what their current arc is, what they're trying to achieve, even if they're all together in the same scene, Forgetting kind of the emotional continuity of what they're trying to achieve and what, where they are right now is much harder if you're jumping between too many viewpoints. And so I find that, you know, even if Dalinar, Navadi, Adolin, and Shallan are all going to be together for a whole thing, I will for a part say, you know, for these 20 chapters, I'm only going to show Dalinar's uh, uh, side and Shallan's side um, so that we can have some continuity of emotional through line for that part. And then I'll mix it up for a different uh, one. Uh, Jeff says, given the many changes the world has seen, what is the state of fantasy publishing? Are there any differences, major or minor, an aspiring author should be aware of? I mean, we lost another of the big publishers recently, right? Um, the, the big five have become the big four. Uh, so that is further consolidation. Um, that is going to have ramifications just means that there are fewer places to sell the, your books traditionally. Um, because a lot of times, different imprints within the same publisher will pass on a book if they know one other imprint is considering it. So where 10 years ago or so, whenever the last merger was with Random Penguin, um, there were six. And so at minimum, you'd have six places, um, probably seven or eight, depending on which specialty press you're sending to, like Scholastic counts as one of the big, um, the big publishers, even though it's not in certain genres it does. Um, so you, back then, you'd maybe have eight places to send. Um, and you know, 
an agent would probably actually send to like 20 or 30, with many of those being repeat uh, publishers but different imprints. But then they will quickly whittle themselves down to the six or eight because they won't want to self-compete. Um, and so now there are just too fewer of those. But of course, the um, advantage of self-publishing outweighs those losses to the point that I think it is still um, it is still easier now to make a living as a writer than it's ever been in the history of publishing. Um, but getting attention for your books is just super hard. Uh, that's become, um, in the last 20 years, and it continues now, getting eyes on your books is the biggest challenge. It's always been the big challenge, but back in uh, the day, uh, there were you were competing against the other books on the bookshelf, uh, which were a limited number that they could stock. And uh, as a new author, you were generally only competing against the, the other new authors, really. Um, and now, um, there's just so many different, the self-publishing has exploded. There's a lot more options. Uh, it's a lot harder to get noticed. And unfortunately, everyone is discovering the same thing that uh, publishing is known, which is that books are a low margin business that don't make a ton of money compared to a lot of other businesses, like toothpaste. Um, and so the reason you don't see advertisements on um, television for books as often as you see advertisements for toothpaste is books are much harder to sell than toothpaste. Uh, the margins aren't as good. And even if they are, not everyone reads books. And even if they, um, even if everyone did, there is so much variety in the book world. Like toothpaste, you may go look and be like, wow, there's like 30 brands here to choose them all. Yeah, go to Amazon and see how many different books you could read right now that are all different by different authors. Um, and uh, traditional advertising is really hard. Facebook advertising and BookBub and things like that are a little better. They can be targeted. But um, the return on investment for that versus toothpaste is much lower. And so even buying ads can be kind of difficult. Um, and then you know you have Amazon going more and more pay to play. Though um, I asked some self-published people I know recently, and they said they've been having very little luck this year specifically with Amazon ads, which is kind of scary because it, you know um, for a while you could just get known on Amazon without having any ads. And then Amazon started charging a lot for ads. And it's, you really wouldn't appear in people's recommended list unless you paid. Now, if you're not even doing that, like, um, I don't know. Um, getting eyes on your books is just super, super challenging. Um, again, more people are making a living now writing, I believe, without any raw data uh, to back it up, than have ever made a living um, with prose fiction writing uh, ever. But that's because a lot more people are trying to. And um, the pie is getting divided into smaller pieces. Um, and it hasn't grown that much. Uh, and so mostly the, uh, the upper bestsellers are being split among self-published, more targeted uh, things, the, the middle bestsellers, I'd say. And the mid lists are completely gobbled up by self-publishing. Um, which is much, can be much more narrow and targeted to a specific audience. Um, but, I mean, you should know that it's still totally possible. Like, publishing is not collapsing. Um, publishing is not going anywhere, at least books aren't. Even if the publishing industry did collapse, books aren't going anywhere. Um, uh, one thing I suppose that's more recent is we did not see the surge in book reading last year that we would normally have assumed from similar circumstances in the past, meaning people are trapped in their houses. Um, usually, a, um, books are usually uh, recession-proof because what happens is um, the things that get hit really hard by a recession are things like vacations or buying a, um, uh, you know, a nicer car or things like this. It's like that, that those more expensive things, and so people tend to continue to read books and enjoy books because instead of taking a vacation, well, they can't afford that, but they can still afford you know, a $5 book. Um, but this last uh, COVID thing, which wasn't a recession, just a really strange occurrence in everyone's life, uh, people didn't, didn't, in fact, read books went down in sales, um, which is counterintuitive to what we would have assumed. 
but everyone was one, wanting to binge Tiger King and not really have to think quite as much because it was so stressful. Um, and it turns out that, uh, that the media of choice for that time was a different type of media, even though people suddenly had a lot more time. They did not necessarily want to spend it on, um, on books. Recovered somewhere around June or July last year um, and has been just a normal year since. With normal trends, e-books have stabilized at their current percentage. Um, uh, print books are losing a little ground to, uh, to audiobooks. Um, but not double-digit percentages, and everything feels kind of stable right now, except with a little bit of growth in audiobooks. Uh, so that's where we stand as far as I know. Uh, there may be people who are paying more attention and have more detailed um, explanations than that. So I am done for the night. Uh, thank you for watching. If any of you did not get the explanation for my loud t-shirt or my loud button-up shirt, you can, uh, you can find the explanation at the beginning. It's quite bright and vibrant, a little more so than normally worn. It's a wonderful gift from my son. Um, I have been Brandon Sanderson. Uh, I'll be back in one week on Wednesday where we will hopefully finish the last, well, we will finish. We'll go until they're done next week um, on the Way of Kings uh, leather bound uh, signature pages. So um, thank you guys as always for hanging out, keeping me company. Uh, let us know, let Adam know in the chat. Um, if you want more uh, visits by random children talking about fan art for books they haven't read, um, uh, or if this was the right amount of children oh talking about me. Uh, otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll see you in a week. Do we have a guest next week, Adam? Mm -hmm. No guest next week. All right, so we'll do fan mail next week. So if you want us to, uh, you want to see your fan mail, uh, get opened up. Uh, try to get it to us by Wednesday next week.